I, I, whatever, whatever. I, don't let me influence your situation one way or the other. No, I, I always wanted to just hit record first because, like, yeah, like fortunately, like uh, you know, I got a great editing team. It's just I don't want to put too much on their plate and uh, do uh, questions and asks like beforehand and like you know, I just uh, always had like the best part of the conversation when the when the button's off. <laughs> Yeah. We, like, do that. we do that all the time all the time so like uh with the salt and pepper uh podcast uh um, what made you want to begin that that's a kind of a it's kind of a long story so so leanda uh she's pepper and it's pepper and salt i don't mean to correct you but she gets she gets violent about it. no i'm just teasing but it's like no i'm first she's as she said to me i'm not gonna let some old white guy go first and i'm always like why why do you have to put old in there all the time like why do you insert that can't i just be a Bad white guy. Nah, what, I can't just be a white guy. Anyway, that's Salt kind of a running joke. The flavor, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and that, well, and that's funny. So we call the people who comment our our listeners. We call them the seasonings. Oh, oh, all righty, all right. So we ask people like, well, what kind of season are you? You know. I mean? But no, it, it it the quick version of it is she and I got to know each other. I was coaching an uh, AAU basketball team that my my sons were on, and I got to know her nephew who became her adopted son um you know he he had a lot of issues and was in group homes and this and that and she sort of pulled him out of all that and so right around the time they were transitioning to live with each other and she was only like 23 at the time so and he's mm -hmm. he's 13 you know what i mean so she's taking on major weight right major responsibility so I got to know him really well he kind of became a little bit quasi part of the family um and that's all the really great part of the story the bad part of the story is he got through, you know, through high school, got into college, had some situations where he got into drugs a little bit and ended up being a little bit homeless, being homeless for a while. Yeah. And just over seven years ago and March 13th, 2017 was walking around a shopping center, allegedly brandishing a pocket knife and cops were called and they shot him four times and killed him. Oh no. Yeah. 26 seconds after they arrived on site. Oh my God. Yeah. They kind of hunted him. I, I talked to another guy on our podcast who has his own podcast uh, about his experiences in Chicago called You Ain't Seen Nothing, which is a great podcast. Six episodes. He just came out with it. And he had an interesting comment about it. I was telling him and I said, I just can't believe that. And he goes, oh, he goes, it was simple to him. He, you know, he comes from South Side of Chicago. He's like, when, when someone rolls <laughs> up and kills you that fast, they're hunting. Uh, so that was really like the first thing he said they were hunting. So fast forward, like two years later, we were sitting, it was like in the backside of a parking lot at a home Depot. And there was a black, a diner called the black bear diner. I don't think you don't have them out East, but it's a diner. It's a typical diner. So we're sure. sitting in the back room, looking out of the parking lot where he was killed and just talking about it. And, and I had known her previously. We had, we had interacted through emails and talking. And it was like, we, we did a lot of coordinating around him. Sure. Uh, but we never really got to know each other. So we were drinking like rum and diets and she all of a sudden turns to me and, you know, like all tragic situations, you start laughing and talking and all of a sudden she turns to me and she shakes her head. She goes, you know, if we had trusted each other sooner, he might still be alive. Oh, geez. And I was like, fuck, you know, so why didn't we? So we started having a conversation about that. And then she's put, start put together a charity in his honor called live, learn and grow. And just in the discussions, her wife, actually, we, she, we'd be in these discussions that were supposed to be a bunch of people. And by the end, it was just her and I talking and she's like, you guys should do a podcast. And so, because what we discovered is like, it's just really hard, especially today. You know, you want to get closer to people. You want to establish connection, go across, you know, cultures, but like, you can't even ask like, well, what does that mean? What does that word mean? Sure. You know, can I say this? Can I not say that? Do you know what I'm saying? It's um, yeah, it's really tough because, you know, like I think uh, at our core, we, we, we don't deliberately intentionally want to actually like like offend somebody. No, you know? no, that, I, I that's how I definitely think it is. And, you know, I think I think we even ask the question because we want to uh, have this mutual connection towards one another. But we want to like right. find out maybe what our boundaries might be ahead of time. That's right. That's you right. Know? So we we've done a lot of stuff like like goofy stuff, like, you know, trading playlists and listen, you know, to, you know, just do like playlist roulette, listen to five songs and okay. you listen to five songs and what did it mean to you? What did you think of it? You know what I mean? Some of the songs were like rap songs that I had heard, but like I discovered that she had no idea. She's 40, not to out her. I think she's 41. Sorry, Leanna. 
but she's not 15. She did not know who Bob Dylan was. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's well, she lives. You not know, gonna now, you now know, like, she lives well, she lives in Fairfield. So now she lives probably 60, 70 miles away. But I mean, growing up, she lived over in Oakland, which is a predominantly black area, you know, versus where I live, Marin, which is predominantly white. It's probably as the crow flies 20 miles away. So in terms of culture. And I'm like, you've never heard of Bob Dylan. You don't know who that is. Like if I said to you, he makes pizzas, you'd be like, eh, I think he might be doing something in media. I've heard the name. I mean, yeah. that's a cultural divide. You kidding? Yeah. Music kind of, you know, sets right? a cultural standard. What I would consider to be, I don't want to say like it. I'm not saying even be able to recite a lyric or a song, but you know, you've never heard blowing in the wind. Right. And it's like, we live 20 miles from, I mean, that, 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 that shocked me. Like, wow. So no, one, no wonder, no wonder we don't get along better. You know, we don't know each other. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's that's yeah. trivializing the bigger issues. And then, you know, not to get too much off on that podcast, but sometimes it, it is, it's hard not to just talk about the black kid that got shot this week. And we, we have definitely had like a bunch of like, okay, how can we get the conversation past that? Because it's just like every week, there's another one. And how can we not talk about it? That's, you know, and now like this week, we got the 84 year old guy that shoots the guy who knocks on his door. And if you heard about that, but no, I did not like, Oh yeah. Some kid um, in, was it back East? No, in Wisconsin. Went to the wrong house to pick up his brother. He went to Johnson Street instead of Johnson Court, knocks on a door. This guy comes to the door and shoots him twice. Oh, fuck. And old man. I mean, so, you know, maybe he's got some dementia. Well, 84 year old man. Jesus. He like, sees a black kid and pulls the trigger. Knocked on the wrong door. Knocked on the wrong door. What the fuck? I know. So it's really, it's, it's hard not to just be like, okay, and there's another episode, you know? So. <laughs> But that's what that's about. And, and, you know, we're not, you know, the idea is just to set an example of places that people can, you know, ask questions and, and just have a conversation where it's like, I hate to use the word safe space, but it's safe to be able to say, so, you know, like she asked me, what's this cornhole about? What, what, what game is that? <laughs> Some All of the right. questions are funny. I mean, that that's the type of game that could actually bring a lot of people together, right? especially on St. Patty's day. Exactly. With drinking involved. So we actually played it together. It was pretty funny. So, yeah. So that's, that is that it's, it's been, it's been fun, you know, how long you been podcast for? a little bit. What's that? Well, how long has the show been going on for? We started last year. We've recorded 21 episodes over the summer. Um, we were really good at first. And then, and then my son who was editing it, um, his, his business, he does marketing, but has a marketing business of his own. He's just took off. He got super busy. So we're, we've, we've had a little hiccup in terms of like we recorded some and he hadn't had time to edit them. Oh yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we're trying to get back to that rhythm in 2023, you know, so we were recording like once a week. Good. So we've done 21 episodes starting March of last year. So we're going to try to get back to like a once every two week pace. And we were on a hiatus, you know, for like the back end of the pandemic anyway. And right. some of us went back to work, got married, uh, moved, like a lot of things. And since that time, uh, now we're at the point where we could just like pick it up, see where we left off and see if there's still interest. And here we are. Awesome. And so you guys are most, uh, you guys are focused on people's experiences in film, entertainment. Yeah. It's one of the primary things like uh, the podcast uh, has like a couple of bullet points that we definitely want to talk about, um, especially with uh, the uh, day players such as yourself, like their journey, like uh, how'd you get involved in acting? Like what, like sure. where, what are the mistakes? What are, what are the, you know, it's more, it's, I kind of I kind of see the podcast as a a place to sort of like uh, a build a community. Um, you know, it's not about what you know; it's all about who you know. And when sure. you come on AFC podcast and you're in the club, you're gonna you're gonna know who's the new guy. Get a little bit background without actually having to shake his hand and have those awkward conversations. But maybe listen to the conversation and get to know the guy before you fall asleep or when you wake up or when you're on cool. the subway. But uh, it, it's also it's also a tool. Um, I think I was gonna say something else really cool. I uh, just, it slipped my mind. Uh, honestly, it'll come back. It, it'll probably come back, but uh, there's always like a, it, it's, Oh, uh, a tool as far as like, it's more of like a guidance counseling type of tool in a way, because uh, especially the more seasoned actors, myself, experienced actor, like we know what the mistakes are. Yeah. And like, if there's a way that we could kind of curb, uh, uh, like shorten the learning curve a little bit where yeah. you not learn by other people's mistakes, just to kind of like wrap it up and uh, fast track people's growth, you know? Yeah. 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 That's good. That's awesome. That's really cool. 
and everybody loves movies in this club. So why not talk about like uh, one of uh, your favorite movies? Like any, like the conversation could go any in any direction, you know? Yeah, excellent. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's a buffer. It's like, oh, I feel like I've known you longer than we've met, like my whole life. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really like listening to podcasts. You know, I mean, I've, I've you know taken some acting classes and I've you know master classes, but it's funny to me the ones where you're listening to someone who's been in it, just you know, oh, I did this audition, I did this, I said that, I thought that. That to me is more helpful than the more structured. You know what I mean? Sure. Personally, Darren, uh, like, uh, how long would you uh, say that you've been sort of like you know voice acting anything like that? So I did it a bunch. You know, I was really interested in it when I was a kid, like high school, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I was like sort of in the in the kind of actory, you know, nerdy acting kid sort of group when I was a kid. Drama club? Drama club type kids, did those plays. I did, you know, there was something called American Conservatory Theater out here, which is still here. And I did the junior conservatory when I was a kid. So I did some of that training and and then did a little bit in college. I was always like the guy... It was like, I, like I'm in, I was in our corporate, and it's not corporate rather, but the recruiting video in college, like, yeah, you can talk in front of a camera. So I did something nice. like that. And then after, you know, after high school, my two best friends from high school, both went off one, one directed a film and, and the other person, they both pretty much worked in Hollywood. I just didn't have that guts. You know what I mean? Honestly, the plunge just, to... yeah, I just didn't have the guts. You know, we, we actually made, and I was just thinking about the other day that I'd love to see the film. Um, we made a film in the summer of our I guess it was must not been senior year because he used it to get into school. We made it like a James Bond movie. Oh, okay. And it would be so awesome to see, right? Like at 16, because he had this cool, his dad had bought him this cool, like old MG. And so that was the cool James Bond car, you know, <laughs> you know, we got Wait. girls to like hitchhike and have mini skirts on and the James Bond girls. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, what's really awesome is one of them, the, one of the main James Bond girls, uh, I, you know, I met in high school and, on and ended up getting married to, and I'm still married to. So it'd be super awesome to see. Oh, shout out. Yeah. As the James Bond girl. What's up, Mrs. But, Stock? <laughs> exactly. And he got into UCLA film school with that. Right. So. Oh, wow. But yeah, those guys plunged wife, in. What's that? Your wife hadn't seen the movie. She's seen it, but we've not seen it in a billion years. It would be, it was like 20 minutes long too. And it was, it was, you know, we shot it in 16 millimeter because his mother was like a, a documentary filmmaker. So we literally, people like cut and paste. We were doing it. We were cutting. Oh my God. Editing. And I mean, yeah. you can't even imagine if you've never done it. I mean, it's, it's, I get, it, I get OCD about that extra, like uh, just doing it digitally and you have to knock right. off like maybe half a second and right. can you imagine going back in going to 11 frames or 13 fl frames and it's like oh my god there's something oh, like so that. and also if i mean you can't you don't have copy i mean if i guess you could make copies but if you screw it up you're dealing with the physical film i mean it's it's intense so we did that um and then fast forward i and i did not follow i started doing corporate stuff business right because and then you know it's it's funny because i People like my my kids' friends or my kids will be like, oh, you know, should I do this? And I'm like, yeah, try whatever you want. But if you have a passion for doing something that isn't easily to make easy to make money at, like acting or music or just anything that's not a kind of an obvious work in a bank type thing, career. I always say, be careful what you get good at. I mean, there's a reason why people do day jobs, right? Because you got you start selling that insurance and you're good at it. Like I was good at sales. I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. good at this. Yeah. Right. I was an English major. I can talk. I can write. I can do presentations. I've got a little bit of acting sort of chop so I can stand up in front of people. Oh, that helps you make sales. Sales helps you make money. And before you know it, you got a car payment and you're married and you have a kid. And guess what? You know, do, doing something risky gets harder and harder and harder. You know what I mean? Right. So I kind of feel like for younger people, just be careful what you do in the interim. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, don't get good at something that makes you 150,000 a year because it's really hard to unhook that. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean because uh, one of my best friends in the world and co-founder of the AFC, um, he uh, he's actually a published bartender. And uh, oh, sweet. he's an actor just like uh, me. Like we met in college. Uh, you know, we've done so much together, lived together. Uh, he was the best man at my wedding. Um, he is just like a, just like an outstanding, intelligent guy. And somehow, uh, not that he can't do it without another thing, but he just got really good at bartending yeah. and uh, he would remember the, you know, the, uh, the mixology of it. Sure. And 
he ended up getting published in a book because he knows how to create and invent uh, different types of cocktails. Nice. Like I, like I, like I, I hadn't had a drink in years until my wedding, and he made me something kind of special, and it, it was actually really good. It was like this peach pink uh, tropical thing. Uh, we were down <laughs> yeah. in Brazil. So it's like, it was like, it was, and it was incredible. And he made that. And the day we met to that moment, never would have guessed in a million years, like he and I would have that much of a backstory together. That's awesome. It was just hard because like, uh, you know, when uh, like that, for the most part paid off right. his college tuition, he's done. Right. A lot and even, projects. you know, e even though bartending is, can be more of a, like a day job, I just mean a day job in terms of like you leave your shifts over, like, whereas you're selling something, you're working on a project, you're a consultant, you go home, you got to send email, you know what I'm saying? At least with that, he could be like, I'm done. But then even that you're like, Hey, now you're the bar manager. Now, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, now you got the additional responsibility. Now you're going to own it. Guess what? You're not going to go audition on Broadway. You know what exactly. I mean? You just uh, yeah, don't have yeah. time, you know, cause it's, and it's also scary and hard, right? Of course, um, like I've, I've let this go many times. Exactly. And, you know, making self tapes now. I mean, it's, it's amazing how much that shit, how much time that takes. <laughs> it does. No, I get it. It really does. And you want to, you know, you want to be uh, presenting your best, the best version of right. yourself. Right. And, uh, you know, here and try to appeal to the casting director. Right. So, so in terms of like the whole acting thing. So when I was in my twenties, I was I was working actually in a restaurant just because I couldn't get any other job as an English major. And I got approached by someone saying, you should be a model. So I did that for a little while. And then I, you know, got into corporate, stopped doing that because I can't, you know, especially back then. Now, you know, you could kind of do both. But back then it was like, hey, can you be downtown for 15 minutes to go have someone, you smile and take a Polaroid, you know, and it's an hour from wherever you are. Like, you just can't, you couldn't do it back then. It was really hard to do anything like a real job because it was like, Oh, you need to be there at three 15. You need to be there at 1145 and you're right. there for 10 minutes and you slate and you smile and say, Hey, I am Marcus. Hi. And you walk around and do whatever the dumb thing they want you to do. And then you leave. Right. Yeah. You know, now you can send self tapes or, or, or there's just, you can send stuff on the internet. Yeah. Um, so I did that. And so then when I was like in my, I went to business school uh, and got an MBA when I was in my early thirties. And so at that point, again, someone else approached me and said, you should do this. So I did it for a couple of years. Um, and then I was, uh, I, I was just finishing. And then the guy at the local agency said, Hey, we're going to have this meeting for the agencies coming and they want like to have a certain number of people come and, and, and interview. So I did, I interviewed with them. Like they want you to make you an offer. They want you to come to New York and they want you to spend the summer in Europe, build up your book do fashion week in Milan and all that stuff. And you kind of got to pay your own way. And I'm like, is this a scam? But when you come back, Ford will represent you in Manhattan. And I, I just did not have a sense of what that meant at the time. I'm like, no, nah. and I said, I'm not doing that. So oh, I finished wow. my MBA, went to corporate work and just kind of forgot about it. And I was like, okay. And I just always had that feeling like, man, I fucked that up. Yeah. I mean, you know, just not enough guts to do it. Right. I remember meeting Ford for the first time. It was actually right around the corner from my first school when I went to college. And, uh, ah. and it was, uh, you know, like, uh, I, like I heard that, uh, Ford model, they, you know, they do some either athletic wear, bride groom, things like that. And right. I had some experience like just as the groom, uh, a oh, bunch cool. of times. And, uh, of course, like, uh, when I'm in my mid to early twenties, like, uh, I'm fine as, you know, like went out to a little bit of modeling still work. And uh, I don't know, just uh, I remember going in, introducing myself, but I did not have like the type of port standardized portfolio or resume that these people were used to, you know, right. like I just had like barely a headshot and <laughs> it got me like it didn't like it didn't even get me past the receptionist, you know, I went in when I went in, there was a uh, the guys passed away now, but it was Grimet. It was one of the old school ones in San Francisco. And I went they always called me the guy with the snaps because I went in there with like snapshots that I'd taken in Hawaii, which apparently I guess you just don't do that. And then they got me proper headshots. They took me on with that with that. <laughs> they were always like teasing me like, bro, that's not what you, <laughs> that's not what you're supposed to do. Well, it's not like they taught it in middle school. Like, what right. are you supposed to do? Exactly. yeah. So so I, that, and that was a fun experience, you know, Um Again, I kind of didn't appreciate it at the at the moment. You know what I mean? I was always like, because I was still like, oh, you know, this this is so. I was really struggling with the idea that like you're just a thing. I remember thinking like, I remember they had this whole conversation about like the fact that my nostrils weren't quite the same, and I'm like, you know, I'm right here. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and like on. now when I do it, like I don't care. Do you know what I mean? Like, but then I kind of cared. Like, I was like, but I'm smart. I have an MBA. You know, like they don't give a fuck. They want you to look good in their suit. That's all they care about. 
You know, yeah. you're they're closing their eyes before they cast you and they're seeing you. If you, if they cast you, they're seeing you in their mind. And they're yeah. going to look through and go, we're looking for Marcus. If, the, yeah. if they're casting me, it's not because I did anything brilliant in the thing, especially modeling. They're like, no, that's the guy. That's that's what I dreamt of when I, when I, I sometimes you'll see their renderings like, oh no, that, that's me. They sketched me out and then they met me. That's how mm-hmm. they pick you, right? It, yeah. I think it's probably like, it's not like acting where you maybe you could win them over with performance. It's modeling. It's like, they've got something in mind. You're a certain height, you're a certain build, you're a certain look, and that's what they want. And so once you're picked, you're good. And for some yeah. reason, like the tr- being treated like a thing, I don't know, I, just, I didn't dig it at that time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, get, I do. I understand. Because I, but I think that was more about like me kind of figuring out like, who am I? What am I doing? And so then I, you know, doing corporate business and I did reasonably well in corporate business and moved up and got executive level jobs. And then it was like, oh, that was really fun. <laughs> You know, hanging out with models and going to weird locations and standing on bridges and getting paid a bunch of money for doing nothing. You know, I'm like, why did I stop doing that? You know what I mean? So fast forward to 2016, I was working on some corporate job. I I will say I was not super great at it because I just was kind of done. I was a little over it, you know. And so they ended up having a layoff and I got laid off as part of this layoff, which I didn't think was going to happen, but it ended up being cool because I started working with my son. He was involved in this company uh, that did that did audio for video games called Barry Sound. Oh, sweet. Yeah, it was really cool. And so very cool. Yeah. So I started, you know, just doing the business side. And then, but then gradually I'm like, can I sit on some sessions? So I take notes for him in sessions and do all the scope work and he'd voice direct. I got to know all these actors and I'm like, this is so fucking cool. These people are so amazing. Um, I have to tell you too, like if you ever, I don't know if, do you know a lot of voice actors? Uh, yeah, quite a few, you know, like uh, by uh, na- like June Foray voice actors or like people I know personally. Or just, you know, personally, we, we would have parties and I'm like, voice actors are cool because they're all really funny. They do yeah. the voices. A lot of them are comedians and they're not vain. They're not walking around like t- looking at themselves because they're like not on print. They're not on camera actors. And they're just fucking awesome. You know what I mean? They're just the, like if you were going to stage a party and you wanted it to be super cool and just like your friends having a party and it just make it seem lively. Just invite like 10 voice actors and have them just filter in as as fake guests, you know, because <laughs> um, they're super fun. You know, we, we put on a bunch of events, you know, for industry and it was just it was a great experience. And in starting in that, I'm like damn, you know, this is really fun. And then a, a couple years into that, I ended up getting invited to be in a film, just to play a short role. And I was like, damn, this is fun, you know? And and in that film was kind of a funny thing. So we're, we're shooting at 6 a.m. in a grocery store um, because it's a, the guy's trying to shoot a pilot about a kid who's a bagger and kind of he's turning 18 and, you know, kind of a day in the life type story, like his struggles as a kid. And I'm just a businessman is coming through with my Bluetooth and being kind of a dick and like kind of talking down to him and, you know, small part. And so afterwards I'm standing there watching them film the next scene. And this woman comes up and she starts kind of chatting me up, you know, slightly older than me. And I'm like, she chatting me up. Like what's going on here? You know, total, total vanity on my part. I'm immediately thinking like, oh, she's like talking to me. Right. I'm completely like egocentric, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. total vanity. And and then all of a sudden they're like, okay, Bettina, you're up. I'm like, oh, she's fucking in the movie, right? Uh, okay. she's, she's in the film. That's why she's talking to me. Yeah. And so then afterwards, I, I went up and I'm like, oh, I should talk to her. And, you know, not that I wasn't nice to begin with, but I was kind of like, why is she talking to me? And then she's like, so who's your agent? I'm like, I don't have an agent. She's like, no, no, you should be doing this. I'm like, you, th- you seriously? And she's an acting teacher out here. And she's like, you know, wow. been, been doing it for years. And so, so I did some work with her and she hooked me up with some headshots then I went and got an agent and, and that's kind of got me restarted for like the third time. And so started doing like print modeling and stuff like that. And then about a year ago, um, started working on doing films. So right. I've been in a bunch of short films, student films, done a couple of SAG things that are, you know, just mostly small stuff, but it's super fun. That Yeah. It sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Was it yeah. hard to get an agent? Um. I mean, because I approached it sort of from the modeling side, so it was pretty easy. I mean, honestly, I it was actually stupid. I, I sat down with my son, and he's like, "This is Google it, top agents in San Francisco." So I literally, <laughs> I googled it, and I remember I went to one that was like in the middle of nowhere, super hardcore. And I'm not saying they were bad, but they just seemed really like sketchy. I'm not ske- not sketchy, but just like you got to do this, and you got to do that. And then the top one at the time, look model agency in San Francisco was late, rated as the top one. 
And he's like, there's an open casting. And we were going to leave. We were going to Italy like in five days. Okay. And I'm like, well, do you want to come back? And he just looks at me and he goes, there's an open casting tomorrow. You're going. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm really busy. He's like, dad, you're not doing shit. I'm like, yeah, no, yeah. no, no, no. I, I got a lot on my plate, like chickening out from doing this. And he's like, I'm driving you. So he drove me. Like, <laughs> not that I can't drive, but he's like, I think he drove me so that he could make me go. And I remember I'm sitting in and there's all these great looking people and all these pictures on the walls and all white and everything. I'm like, oh, fuck, this is absolute disaster. What am I doing here? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I talked to him and they're like, yeah, we'll put you in lifestyles, which I wanted to be in fashion, but I'm sort of aged out of that a bit. And like, yeah, we think you have a good look. Let's do it. And they're like, you know, do you want to sign up or something? I'm like, great. So you're going to think about like, no, like, do you want to sign up? I'm like, here, we have contracts. Take these. I'm like, come back tomorrow and we'll sign them. I'm like, okay. <laughs> So is that like a, it was, was it exclusive, non-exclusive they were offering at the time? Yeah, or? it's, an, it's a, you know, it's an exclusive for two years, but you can get out of it and this and that. And so then I started going on castings and stuff, did not book anything for the backside of the year. And then COVID happened. Oh, and, damn. and I wasn't in it enough. I didn't realize that people did work a fair amount in COVID. I didn't. Cause I was like, fuck, that's, that's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah. It stopped. You know what I mean? Um, but then as soon as it ended, you know, I went and did a thing at a winery. So I've done a bunch of stuff. You look at like my Instagram, it's all me like drinking wine. <laughs> you know what oh, I mean? That's, a, that's an awesome gig. Hanging out with fake. Well, yeah, dude. I mean, you get paid, you know, $1,500 for a day to sit around and sometimes they give you some of the wine, you know what I mean? And, and uh, oh, as a gift, as a thank you, as a courtesy, something like that. Yeah. And what's funny about that too, is that, is that uh, it's like anything that seemed, you know, when I first did it, I was like all stressed and then do a few more, less stress. And then, you know, start auditioning for film. And it's like, oh my God, modeling is like nothing, right? Because you just show up and take a picture of you. Like yeah. you got to say lines on camera. That's highly stressful. You got to remember things, <laughs> you know, take direction. Don't look at the lens. You're know? <laughs> like, holy shit. Or are you able to do like, uh, well, you did a little bit of, did you, you, did you act in the James Bond movie when you were in high school? I was James Bond in the movie, bro. I was oh, the star. you were James Bond. Fuck yeah. Oh, I was dude. the star of it. No, that's why I got to see it. Not it's got to be incredible. Oh, man. So my, my older brother was the bad guy. He was he was dressed. I don't know where we got this. He had a we had a gorilla suit and he had like a we put a suit over. it. So like the, he was like a like a gorilla, like a human. But he was a gorilla, but he was the bad guy. It's really bad. Got it. It's got to be just the Perfect. worst movie ever made. That, <laughs> but and what was it like? Uh uh, what, it wasn't a super eight film. You used 16 millimeter. You it was said? 16 millimeter. So the quality of it was decent. Yeah. And it was, it was like 15 minutes long. <laughs> Car <been> chase. <laughs> yeah. So then actually speaking of voice actors, so I was out in New York, um, visiting my, our daughter and, and, um, I ended up just grabbing a cocktail with a woman named Shelly Shinoy. who's a voice actress in Manhattan who we had hired a bunch of times. I mean, she was like one of our go-tos, like, you know, oh, we need someone to do this voice tomorrow. Boom, just call Shelly. Got home studio, boom, she'd bang it out. She's awesome. She was in um uh in in one, you know, we one of the, the one of the big titles we worked on was Walking Dead. And and so she was one of the main characters in Walking Dead. And so um, you know, we she we ended up having a cocktail and I was like, oh, you know, you know, my agent's not doing that much. And she's like, dude you got to get on the stick. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you got to get on like casting networks and backstage and actors asset access. You should be auditioning. Yeah. Like get yourself out there. She just don't, I mean, your agent's like one of the tools. And so I started doing that. And then I started getting a lot more stuff and access. And I've, and like, now I've just been doing like a bunch of student films and I've done in the last month or so I've done, I did a TV pilot. That's like micro sag. And then I did a film last Friday that's also going to be micro sag, you know, low budget projects, but they're paid and they're, you know, they're going to get in festivals. And the one, I mean, this guy's going to try to pitch it to like Hulu. Yeah. Uh, you know, no. small parts. It, it adds up, you know, yeah. you're, get, you're getting the repetition in. Yeah. I mean, it's like somebody said to me, another actor said, man, just say lines. You need to say lines in front of a camera. That's what you need to be doing. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, if you want to get good at it, because there's no substitute for that. I agree. Yeah. No, I do. I agree. Yeah. So that's when, what I've been doing. And, you know, it's just, I always go through the same thing. Like I'll be like memorizing my stuff and then I'll be like, I can't remember these lines. I can't say them right. And I like, my wife just laughs at me. And then like, there'll be a point I'm like, why am I, I'm not doing this again. Fuck it. I'm not doing this again. This is the last one that I'll do it. And I'll come back. I'm all jacked up. I love doing that. <laughs> so it's, it's a cycle, you know, pain. I, like I get it. I'm excited. The doubt and fear. And then I do it. And I somehow get through it and I'm super elated, you know, <laughs> 
you probably know the site, the spiral. No, I do. Like, uh, you know, you get excited about things and of course, like it might be a little bit uh, ahead of yourself, whether or not you've been cast already, but it keeps, honestly, it keeps your hope alive either which way, whether or not you're working. Yeah. And Did one thing I love it? about the student films is the energy of these guys is so good. They're so pure and they're so pumped about it. And they're just, you know, they got vision. You know what I mean? And and, and honestly, a couple of things I've been in, you know, you can definitely see the seams, but they're good ideas and pretty well written. And and like, I'm thinking if you can do this for no money, what if you had a hundred thousand dollars? You know what I mean? If you can't, if you can master the little things, you'll be a, a master of a greater thing later, you know? Exactly. You know, if you can do it with, kind of you know if you can like be on the you know play basketball on the uh, you know in the dirt with no shoes what happens when you get in a gym with good shoes you know what i mean so all takes some of these guys i don't know i'm really impressed and, and it's just their fun i love the energy do you have sort of like an aspiring uh goal that you want to do as an actor to kind of be like i, I want to be the villain i want like i want to jump off a cliff like stunts or anything oh, like that'd that be super fun doing a fight scene would be really fun actually i was in a film i was in a corporate film where we did a fight scene where we did like <laughs> it was kind of a faux fight scene actually i had one line in the thing they had one me to stand up and go far fight and scream that we just start throwing shit at each other yo all fun. right yeah that-, that was super fun um no, my whole portfolio right now is just bad white guy things. Bad older white guy. So I was in a film called Ouroboros where I play a, a, a you know a, a movie agent. And so right. of course, I've got my ingenue there, this cute young woman. Obviously, I'm going to hit on her. Obviously, I'm going to tell her that we need to discuss her career up at my house. And then yeah. a couple scenes later, she tells me she's pregnant. I tell her to get rid of it. You know, that, that's that one. I played drunk dad, a lot of drunk dad abusive dad mean dad um oh. play this one that we did last friday this film called daily city uh i play a used car salesman so you know i'm, I'm getting the range i probably need to be like a serial killer i need to be that you do maybe like uh i played well okay, okay the in the um <laughs> in the one black friday that we just did which is a it's basically a story of a guy who's in the silicon valley you know, doing the high tech world, but he's black. And it's kind of like how he has to code switch. And it's kind of interesting. It's, I think it's a great, it's going to be, I mean, I hope he sells it, not just selfishly, but I think it's a, it's a good, it's a story that needs to be told about what it's like for black people in tech. Cause there's just not a lot. And so on that, I actually play a pretty benign character. I'm his, I'm his client and he's presenting to me and we have some interaction. So in that one, I'm not a bad guy. So that's the first one. that's not just a pure, like evil white guy. Well, it's this one uh, that you did called the family planner. So that, okay, that's so funny that you, so that was the first one that I did. I'm just in that as I'm, I'm like the senior partner. Um, so that's Bettina's film. She called me up, the, the woman who originally had said you should do this. And she's like, yeah, we're doing this movie. That's actually a really good little movie. It's a movie about a couple that inherits a house from an aunt and they find this book. And in the book there, it's like pictures of them. It's like, it's like a, that's a family album, right? And all of a sudden they're flipping through the pages and they're like, wait, how did she get, how did my aunt get pictures of you as a baby? And they're flipping forward and all of a sudden they shut the book and she's like, don't open it. And he's like, why? He goes, because there's pictures that haven't happened yet. Oh. Yeah. And so he starts freaking out because he looks ahead and he figures out that she has a baby and it's not his baby. Oh no. Uh, Right. And so he's freaking out and he's following her around. So there's a scene that we shot outside in a cafe in San Francisco. And so I'm sort of the, kind of the handsome senior partner. So he, she and I are having lunch. So I don't have any lines. We're just, it's just filmed from, it's filmed from his perspective. Like he's hiding. So yeah. he, it's funny. We didn't rent the thing because he, he was a low budget. So he just filmed from out of the car across the street. And so, of course, of course yeah. we're in this cafe. We've got every table taken with crew and there's one fucking lady in the shot and she's writing a novel on her goddamn laptop. And she's right in the shot. And we're like, waiting, 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 waiting. Finally, we're like, Hey, you know what would be cool is if you had coffee inside, we'll buy you some apple pies. Finally, we got her to move. But we didn't yeah, want to tell the shop because then you have to pay and get permits. And, you know, we were just doing a total rogue shot, right? And so I was that. I was the guy that was talking with her. And, and yeah. so that was, Dana, that was Dana's boss. That was Dana's boss. And so my, my, uh, and my big ad, my big, my big acting choice in that, which actually turned out to be, it's in the film, you can see it. And, and the director dug it. So we're sitting there and it was cool because we had a, a iPhone open on speaker, right? Because we weren't recording sound. So we're talking to the director 
And he's like, okay, do this, look at each other. And I'm like, you know, he's like, kind of touch her. And, you know, you know, I, I want we were supposed to do things that would make the husband look jealous. So the right. suggestion I had is like, it's great if I touch her hand, but she should touch my hand. Oh, because if she says to her husband, Hey, he's creeping me out. That's one thing. But it's like, if your girlfriend's saying this guy's creeping me out, but she's touching him, like, how does that play? So that was my big, that was my big acting ad. <laughs> I was like, yes, I contributed. No, you must have because uh, your scene partner uh, was that uh, was that Karen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, she, she won Best Actress uh, in the uh, for this in uh, twenty twenty. No, it, it was it was all this. It was all the um, you know, it was all the, it was all everything I gave her. And no, she's yeah, she does she does stand up. She does improv. She's great. She's really good. Uh, you, you chipped in somehow. It's just like, hey, remember that I, uh, assist I gave you? That was the we... only, that was my assist. She dug it too. She's like, oh, that's so good. And then she kind of reaches up and kind of strokes my arm. And then I think even the thing he even adds, like, you were touching him. So it was a thing. That was my, that was my ad, but that was really fun. And I'm like, wow, this is fun. You know? Yo, like if uh, I'm looking around, if you guys got a trailer, I'd love to show it out on the podcast when we stream it on YouTube. Yes, yes, yes. I'll send it. It's, 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 and it's like a 15, 20 minute film. I actually think it would be a good feature if they, they could definitely string out the plot. Oh, that seems like a really fun idea where this guy yeah. is, is he that insecure where he can't let the girl go, uh, where he has to be with her the rest of his life or vice versa? Well, they're married and they're, oh, okay. I, 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 it's like telling a joke the wrong way. Like, so the backstory is they're having, like, as they're sort of around the house at the beginning, they're like, well, we have a house now. We've been, you know, we've inherited this. I didn't know you were that close. And there's the backs, the back banter with them is they're talking about having a kid. And he's kind of like, I don't want to have a kid. Or maybe she doesn't want to have a kid. They're, you know what I mean? They're having some interaction about like, will we or won't we? Are we going to have it? Are we not going to have it? And they're married, right? So it's not just like some girl he's dating. And then all of a sudden it's like, my life doesn't miss, you know, my future maybe doesn't revolve around you kind of thing. Right. Okay. So you got really insecure. I got to see the movie then. Like, well, I mean, next- he gets insecure. I mean, the thing is, he gets insecure because he looked at the future. Like, it's not like he's, you know, he wasn't insecure before he looked at the future. And he, and so basically what happens, not to spoil it, but he, he kind of misinterprets some things he sees. And then in the I, end, you, you figure it out. They should, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a reveal at the end that makes you go, oh, that's it. Right. On, yeah. You might, you got some room to play here. You could really stretch this out. And honestly, your character, if you know, you're there, Dana's boss, like, Right. Yeah, a lot of room for growth there. Right. That's what I told him. I said, you know, there could be more scenes. I'll write a few. <laughs> I got a great idea for like, uh, you know, the uh, the corporate retreat. <laughs> right. I know it's funny. The um, And this thing I was in Black Friday, the guys pitching us, it's a, you know, it's a, what do they call a QBR, a quarterly business review. And I'm like, yeah, you're great. You're awesome. I mean, I, as his client, I clearly like this guy and his boss, the, the, the tension is that he's, he's giving the whole presentation with this guy, this guy, this kid was so good at being a douche. He's his Tyler and Tyler does nothing, but the boss, Peter is like, that was great. Tyler, you know, it's just, you know what I mean? It's like, he's completely favoring this other kid. I mean, this other guy, the other rep. And so I was like, well, you could have me be like a bit of a mentor to him, like an ally, like, dude, you're talented. You're smart, you know, kind of a thing. I could, I could. I could, uh, you know, he and I, maybe we go to golf together and I like, you know, as his client, I'm like, give him, I give him a leg up, right. You know, I, I give him encouragement kind of thing. So, you know, right. I was, I was pitching for future episodes. Why not? Right. No, I don't blame you. And you know, <laughs> if, if you get inspired, like I remember when I did my first short film, you know, I really thought like, uh, episode two, like what happens the next day, but I guess we just, you know, just a nice little, little short story, move on to the next one. Exactly. Right. I did. I had a lot of fun, especially it being my first one to kind of see like whatever did happen to these characters, you know? Yeah, we did one that was really fun um, where uh, uh, there's one on there's one um, that you can see it's on YouTube called Two Bits. And it was part of the Berkeley uh, Cinema Club, part of UC Berkeley. And, and this is the one where I'm like, there's all these special effects. And it. it's basically... This kid's, you know, the idea of like, you know, kids in college, he's, he's a med student and he's literally falling apart. So like, you know, his like eye falls out, his arm falls off and, but everyone's kind of like, oh, your arm fell off. So it's, it's gory, but it's sort of this tongue in cheek, like nobody, you know, nobody does what you would normally do if someone's arm fell off, which is call 911. You know what I mean? Like, so he's at a bus stop and he's talking to the cute girl and she's like, do you need help with that? And he's duct taping his arm back on. So I play his kind of mean dad, like telling him that, you know, he needs to get a job and this and that. So 
Yeah, that 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 I feel like could be like a longer one too. You know what I mean? My sister kind of says things like that to me all the time. Well, I say, and I have this really mean line. I'm like, well, maybe if you like handle things better, you'd be more successful like your sister. You know? Oh, yeah. And even that, like we've talked, we've spoken to uh, quite a few guests so far. And like, we've talked about art and is it done? Like, what is ex- what is success? And all, all these little things where you could actually take like true true points of view and try to identify, you know, maybe even use that uh, in your backstory of your character where totally. like, you know, you never know you're going to get inspiration from because success it's different with everybody. And uh, I, I don't know. I just think it's one of those made up things that it's not, it doesn't actually really exist. It's just sort of like a, a perception of a thing of another thing that doesn't exist. Like what, like who want, who wants to be the richest man in the graveyard? You. Yeah. That's a great way of saying it. I love that. The richest man in the graveyard. Well, that's so true. And it's, you know, it's so easy to, you know, be focused on, I mean, it's good to focus on the future, but it's, it is also easy to be obsessed with it, I think, and, and miss, and it sounds so corny to say it, but sort of miss the moment. You know what I mean? You want to have that drive, you know, yeah. uh, like you want to aspire to be like the greatest version of yourself. And I guess have your own, like, uh, I feel, you know, you know what you want to be when you get older is accomplished. You don't want to be right. successful. You, you, you don't, you don't want to be successful. Um, Cause I think that's just, uh, I don't know. It's got, it's got a bit of a vanity to it, but when you have some accomplishments under your belt, those, those, those are the things that live on, you know, that you're like your personal story, your legend, you know? Well, and that's the thing too, like for doing this acting stuff, I was like, this is challenging. It's hard. You know, I mean, it's like, Very if, hard. even if you've only got like a couple pages, I don't know if you, but I stress out, you know what I mean? Like, like I want to know it. I want to be prepared. And it's like, you know, what you if know. you don't do it right? You know, what if you don't give them what they want kind of thing? You know what I mean? And anxious get like the, like the pre-fight jitters. Totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, I guess also too, just doing business stuff. I just, I don't know, to me, it just felt like the same over and over. And I guess if you did like a hundred films and were more successful and made a bunch of money, I, I could see this also becoming routine, but I mean, at least right now it's, it's quite, it's a ride. You know what I mean? Every time I'm on set doing something, it's like, it's, it's always its own thing. You know what I mean? It's always its own kind of thrill ride. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I surely do. Well, I got I got a question about this one uh, short film you had mentioned. It's called da- uh, Daily City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's that one about? So that's one we just shot. Um, we shot last week, and so that's a cool story. It's an it's an immigrant story. Uh, the guy Nick uh, Hartanto, the director and writer of it. It's basically a story about when he was a little kid, and his dad got a job. And his dad was like doing door to door sales. You know, didn't have doesn't have good language skills. They're they're living. They've come over here from Indonesia. And just trying, trying to make it in San Francisco. You know what I mean? There's a little Indonesian community there up on the hill and, uh, you know, pretty blue collar area. It's a little town just outside of San Francisco. It's kind of, it's kind of like where there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people that are working in the city and, and the blue collar jobs go commute into the city from there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so the scene we did was his dad, his dad gets a job in a used car dealership. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's, we're there, we're there, we're clowning around, you know, we're, we're being sort of, and we're not bad. At first I was like, when I talked to Nick, I'm like, so, I mean, are we the racist guys making fun of him? Cause he's Asian. He's like, no, not really. He goes, you're, you're hazing him, but it's good nature. And you're mostly hazing him. Cause he's the new guy, you know? Oh, clean the oh, pot. Yeah. That, that's common. Like I, I would yeah. get my boss busted, but it's just like a way that they get to know you and that to show that they actually like you. Cause if they didn't like you, they wouldn't talk to you at all. Exactly. And it's not mean spirited, but there is this, there's this, cool interaction where so his son comes in his little son this kid um who's just so good he comes in and he um he plays bastion and he comes in and you know we introduce him to him we're joking around you can see the kids getting pissed off right um because we're joking around and uh i'm gonna say it wrong but his dad's name is like haratanto yeah ha, ha, i'm gonna say it wrong. but anyway in indonesian and so we call him harry and so hey. there's a later scene where, where Harry, you know, we ask Harry to go clean the coffee cups and, and then at some point, he, you know, the son says to, to the dad, like, you know, they're being mean to you. They're laughing at you. And the son, dad's like, Hey, I get it. But like, this is what I got to do to survive yeah. in this world. I mean, he doesn't say it exactly like that, but, and then he sends him out to get the donut. So then there's a confrontation between the guy who is the, owns the car dealership, the main guy, Mike Harvey kind of big, robust, tough guy. That's always like, Hey, Hey buddy, you know, slap on the back type guy. 
And he looks at him and he's like, he's like, why do you call my dad Harry? And he says, I mean, it's just business kid. I mean, it's, it's easier for the customers. And he goes, well, that, he goes, I mean, he goes, it's not personal. He goes, it's not his name. He goes, it's not personal. He goes, well, it's his name. What can be more personal than that? And he just stops Harry in his tracks. Right. So it was a cool, you know, kind of perspective thing. Um, and, and, you know, the mom's involved There's a scene in the church with the mom and the church ladies. And it's just kind of telling the story of like this little family unit is, you know, do kind of doing what they have to do surviving as immigrant immigrants in San Francisco. It's a very sweet story. And I think it's going to be, these guys have really good cinema, cinema, cinematographic, however you say that, you know, experience. I, I think it's gonna be a very pretty film and also a cool message. You know, I had a, uh seen one film from indonesia that i thought was incredible uh we hosted a film festival this past year here in new yeah. york for ah, Queen, cool. of course so uh yeah it was our first one and it went very well um and uh it was it was supposed to be exclusive for new york city filmmakers but uh i had uh some extra hours so i opened it up a little bit more to get some more fillers in and one film happened to be from indonesia and uh you know how like uh you ever see like uh chicken fights like uh down in the south where like uh they used to do like roosters fighting each other yeah or things like that or even like even a little bit more uh hostile where there's like a uh, dog fighting things like that so uh in indonesia yeah. it's not as uh it's nowhere near as bad it's more of a sport than anything they have these very unique uh rams very unique goats uh, that they caretake for that they're like the prize bull and they do it in a very competitive and goats. athletic way. Yes. Rams. Like, these things are, <laughs> these, things, these things are monsters. These no, and these things yeah. are huge. Just so smacking like, each other. I've seen, I mean, I've seen goats, I've seen Rams doing that. So it's like, it's almost like a, a point system and a, and wow. a dance of the relationship between taming your, taming your animal and, uh, and and actually like being uh like a uh, one with like one with the goat like the it, it was oh my god i'll i'll uh I'll, I'll play the trailer and the podcast and try to like uh, throw back into it but it was just a beautiful story that's epic like i i don't i didn't speak the language but i was able to like follow it as best i could and it was a nice just a nice little documentary about this I I don't know if it was considered like the South, the North, the the rednecks, the Hicks, the, the or what the culture is actually like. It's so it's so broad, you know. It's a lot yeah, of pepper, yeah. and a lot of salt, but it was a beautiful. I think it was a beautiful story. And when she cried, I started crying because she was crying, you know. Like, oh, was, that's awesome! Wow, no, that's it, good. it was really sweet. But it was just really nice just to see how the relationship with people and animals, even in a sport in a sports arena, on you know just from a different culture, how you know we do things similar with like, I don't know, dog shows where we have sure. a run through the loops or something like that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Bull riding, for example, is very big in the South, you know, yeah, or Texas, yeah, it's Texas. I don't know about South, but you know, Yellowstone out that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny too. Cause even this little community is still there. So he lives in New York now, the director, writer, director, he's moved, moved to New York 15 years ago, but so he was coming out to film it here in his hometown. And, and there's actually a scene in a church, a really funny scene where apparently the mom, she was working and they were going to do go to the church. And I guess everyone was a potluck. Everyone's going to bring something. And, every, you know, all the moms, like a lot of the moms didn't work, but she did. So she just grabs a casserole, goes to a Chinese restaurant, gets some chopped chicken and puts it in there and puts it out on the table. And everyone's great, great, great. And people start eating. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. And someone's like, did you make it? And she just kind of decides like, yeah. So she just goes with it. And about 20 minutes later, they announce the guy gets up and says, oh, the, you know, the winner of the potluck contest is Ellie. And it's his mom wins. And she has to get up and give an acceptance speech because she served this Chinese chicken that everyone thinks is Indonesian because no one, you know, who, how would anybody know? And I asked him, did she seriously get up and do that? He goes, word for word. She just was a baller. You know, she just was thought on her feet. And, uh, and it was a great time though, to the end of the movie, because, um, She's like, yeah, you know, you just let people believe what they want to believe. And you can sometimes use it to your advantage. And, and she goes, you know, there's like a chef chow or some, some cooking show they always watch. She goes, you know, I, I know someone who met him once because he had a very stylized Chinese accent, right? Sure. Couldn't speak English. This TV show that they watched and they're discussing is, you know, I know someone who met him. He speaks perfect English. And the kids, oh, like, 
the kid's like, what? He's like, yeah, he goes, but he does it. And he's like, you know, no one wants, no one wants to see him speak perfect. They want him to speak chop broken English. Cause that's their image. And he, and he has a TV show and you know, he's making it happen. Right. He's letting. And so is he selling out? You could argue. Yeah. But I mean, he's also making, you know what I mean? Like he's giving them what they want. Right. I mean, like he, there was uh, Mr. The actor who played Mr. Miyagi did like when I first right. heard him do a legitimate interview, I'm like, that's not him. Yeah. But <laughs> But then he turned on, he turned on the character of Mr. Right. Miyagi. Right. And, and you're like, wait, that's acting shit. No, that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, and, and I think that the essence of the film, and it it's was. a really sweet ending too, because in the very end of the film, the family has like a traditional, like the kid asks for like a traditional meal, which is, I guess, a big deal. in um, a lot of immigrant families, like the kids, like, I don't want to eat that. Uh, don't make those smells. My friends come over. And so at the end, they all eat this traditional Indonesian food and they click on the TV and they watch the cooking show with the guy speaking that, you know, the hyper Chinese accent guy. And so it was kind of like, yeah, we're all making it happen, but you know what I'm saying? But within those trade-offs, they still have their identity as a family unit, which I guess was sort of the message. I just thought it was a cool little, they wrap it up really nicely. You know what I mean? Those elements. Sure. Yeah. So it's going to be a nice little film. When do you pretty excited about that? So yeah, that we just, we just did that. We was a one day, full day, 12 hour shoot at this car dealership. That was fun. It was just one scene. There's a few scenes there. So there's a scene where he comes in. There's another scene where he's leaving. Then there's one, like a fantasy scene where when he's, he has a scene, there's the thing called a durian. Do you know what a durian is? I had never seen one, but it's like, it's like the size of like bigger than a football and it's spiky and it's sharp. And like when it ripens, it smells like we're like rotten onions or something, apparently. Huh? No, and it's, and it's, it probably weighs like five pounds. So there's a scene and they set up this whole thing. Brown? Is it brown? And you open it up and there's black seeds in the middle. You know, I didn't see it open, but yeah, I, I'll go with that. But it's spiky like a porcupine. You know what I mean? And it's, I mean, it hurts. Like if I, if you caught it out of a second story window, it would probably, you'd be, your hand will be bleeding. It's like spikes. And yeah, so he yeah, has this tough. little kid kind of in the middle of when we're all laughing and scratching. All of a sudden it goes into fantasy and this durian hits Mike Harvey in the head. And, and like knocks him out, kills him or knocks him on the ground. And then he kind of fades back in. And obviously th- none of that happens. Right. That's, but that's in his fantasy that he's like, you know, cause he's mad. He's like, screw this guy. Right. Um, let's, let's, let's kill him off. You know, I mean, it's not, it's fake violence. So that we, you know, so that, that, that scene took a long time to set up. And so, and then the other scenes where he's talking to Mike alone. So yeah, it was a full day. It was a good, it was, it was a good one day thing. And they shot, it took him a week to shoot it. There's a couple days in the church, a couple days in the house. Probably about a 15 minute film, I think. Okay. Yeah. Did he have any uh, director have any plans on like next step? Just put it through the film festival or just one for fun? Film festival. Yeah. 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 And he had another film that won a bunch of awards. So, I mean, I think it's, you know, to build the portfolio. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. I mean, he's been a working cinematographer, you know? And so, you know, I think it's, that's actually a question I have is like, so what is the path of these guys? Are they, is it, I did a 15 minute, you know what I mean? Like, is, do people, okay, I've done it. I did a 15 minute one or I did a three and they're epic, you know, and I got awards. Now someone's going to give me money to make a feature. Is that, is that the path of these guys? It seems like more like the fantasy route, but that's kind of the, that's kind of basically the idea. Like, you know, it, I think it's a way to actually build trust. Uh, Cause uh, countless people don't know you until they do. Um, right. and those, that time in between, uh, you do want to, you do want to have experience. You do want to keep your, you know, your creative muscles very, you know, very strong, keep your blade really sharp. Uh, everybody comes into this, I think with different motives on why they're doing it. You know, yeah. uh, some of it's money driven. Some of it is like uh, for, not for some uh, because they just love being around it. You know, they just make them feel alive, makes them happy. Yeah. Uh, it, Welcome to Happy Corner. This project strives to make safe housing areas for stray cats at an affordable price. It's so easy to put together that even your children could have fun making one. Help keep cats and other animals safe with their own little Happy Corner homes. You can help this project become a reality by donating to the GoFundMe page. Happy Corner homes are a great way to show those animals in need. It's okay to be happy.
I can only speak for me and uh, a little bit on being the director of a film festival and getting to know these guys. Yeah. Um, it seems like the younger you are, of course, you want to build and have a real legitimate life doing that one thing you love. Yeah, All the yeah. power home. I couldn't agree more. Like I, I that that's what I still aspire to do as well. I think like, especially now with the end in mind, you always have to have the end in mind uh, when you make a decision. It's like, uh, in every su successful story, like uh, you got to have uh, basically uh, the way out, which is the, the the next step after you've completed and achieved your goal. The goal is to keep doing it again. Sure. These guys, ideally, it's all, a lot of it's business, but, you know, you're kind of building a house constantly and then leasing it out, renting it out, selling it, all of these different things. Right. And there's such a demand for the most part uh, for like a decent quality, good, uh, good, good piece of work. And uh it doesn't it doesn't take much to actually get to that point, but I think for it depending on the filmmaker, bro, and I know this is a really long answer. Like the short answer is I don't know, but I think ultimately, like nowadays, you wanna like have it, you wanna go back to the movies yourself. You wanna watch your, a movie right. you did in the movies. Like that's for me, especially how you know when I got started, I wanted to actually sit down and just watch. And yeah. maybe something that I was a part of, maybe something I directed or that I wrote, like just be the quiet guy. Nobody knows who I am, not necessarily the star, but just like, you know, that came out of my head and I see it right in front of me. And I look to my left, I look to my right and everybody's clapping, things like that. I think that's what everybody aspires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, a, I guess it's just a random, you know, a random, I mean, in some ways the acting part seems e easier is the wrong word, more straightforward, at least easier in that sense. Like, how do you, I wonder, how do you get from, like, let's say you've made like, like the guy that made, um, um, family planner. I mean, he's done a few shorts. He, he's obviously skilled. He's good at making a pretty good looking movie for not a ton of money. Like, how do you, I wonder how you make that jump to have someone hire you to make a feature. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And give you, you know, I mean, what's a minimum real feature that might make it into, you know, a theater or Netflix? Like, it seems like these days you need at least like a million bucks. I think you got to pay somebody to get in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was on one. It's interesting that I've seen a couple guys. So I had a small part in one in, in March that was part of a corporate video that was like, it had to be a half million dollar budget because they filmed for like three months. They made a 40 minute film that they were going to show at a corporate kickoff for a company called Snowflake. And it was a film about two sales guys and one minute they're in a meeting and they, you know, uh, this strange shaman dude takes them and shows one of them the bathroom. And all of a sudden they're in the middle of snowy Tahoe, you know, yeah. what I mean? in the woods. And it's how they get back. Right. And they're, they're going on kayaks and people are chasing them. And, you know, it's sort of this, the story is like, you know, they learn to work better together. And so they're showing it to the sales team. They're showing it to the, to the, to the assembled sales team and they broke into pieces and whatnot. I mean, that had to be a half million bucks. And I asked the director, you know, this guy, Avery is like, I mean, so are you making these as a stepping stone? He's like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like I basically, it's like, this is his day job is making corporate videos. Do you know what I'm saying? So he's yeah. which is kind of cool. Right. Not no, not at all. That's fun. As long as then you can take the money and, and then redirect that into making, doing something that's a bit more artistic. Oh, this, I'm not saying it wasn't artistic, but it was, you know, it was for corporate. It wasn't, you know, a, 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 a you know, if you love what you do and like, if this guy like ever took a decent paycheck and wanted to do like a, a one act play, a one man show right. and do something like that, you know, like uh, I've been in one act plays. It's been, it, like, it's a, it's a treat and a tr treasure to actually see other like actors really pursuing right. it and like, but, like good storytelling. It's hard to really see yeah. once in a while, but you get, you get that lucky break and uh, you just get to be taken aback by a live performance right in front of you. Uh the guy, I guess, like it's uh, it's really it's really up to him, you know, if he wants to continue doing corporate videos and having a great time doing it or uh, maybe create his own thing and start on the stage nice and small. And then well, I think that's what some of these yeah. guys are doing, though, is they're taking the proceeds from those. So there's another guy I was on something else, um, a short. It's a, a TV show that's they, there's a second season of this on Amazon Prime called Douchaholics. It's actually a pretty funny concept. It's basically like a. Oh, like an Alcoholics Anonymous thing. Everyone's in a room. You know, it's your typical scene. They're all sitting there. Hi, listen. my name's Marcus. I'm a douche. And so it's all, it's instead of saying I'm an alcoholic, it's, 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 uh, you know, you do douchey things. 
like the one guy's one of the main, like the first episode, the guy's like his douchey thing is he just, he's, he's really ripped and he just loves to take shirt off. And so like, he's constantly trying to think of an excuse, even in the, even in the meeting to like take a shirt off. I was like, don't do it. Don't do it. You know what I mean? And he, he has a thing where he like, he loves to come on to girls that are with boyfriends to like prove himself. Right. Like, in other words, he's constantly just trying to like, he's insecure, you know what I'm saying? And so he's just, it's everything's just over the top, you know? I'm looking um, at that. Yeah. And so I was in a very small part of that, but it was very clear. Those guys have a really slick marketing company and they definitely are taking the proceeds from their day job, which is marketing and channeling it into creative stuff, which I think is pretty cool. That's smart. I mean, you, yeah. like, you know, a lot of people you invest, like, I think st the stock market is a bit of a gamble as an investment, more or less. But yeah. like, what if you actually did invest into actually performing uh, your own creation? Why not? That's it. And so they done. It's pretty cool. I mean, it's it's on Amazon. For some reason, you have to pay for it, which is a bummer. So I would suggest you look at it. Uh, but yeah, I think you have to pay like seven dollars for a season. But yeah, we we filmed one. There's one of the characters goes on like a fantasy thing and ends up like in heaven. And so she meets, uh, she meets you know, Jesus and Moses and, and, um, you know, a, a bunch of religious figures. So I play one of the religious figures. I play Abraham. Oh, you played Abraham? Like yeah. Father Abraham, the guy who started it all? It's the guy that started it all. I play, I wanted to play Moses because I like that party in the Red Seas type thing. And then, you know, a fantasy is <laughs> about being like Charlton Heston, but no, I was Moses and it's cool. I got all this makeup. I look amazing. It's just crazy. Um, oh geez. but that was so, super fun. Yeah. And then they have us like singing a rap song and dancing and stuff. So oh, I have no idea what that's going to look like. It's going to look so, amazing though. I'm sure it did because like Abraham, you know, he still was getting women pregnant in his nineties. You know, Is that maybe, right? Uh, well, oh, you don't know the story of Abraham. Well, he lives like 700 years, right? Uh, I don't think he lived. I'm sure he did, but like, cause everybody back then they were, fine i know noah was approximately 700 years old like uh yeah before, maybe that was noah yeah before that i'm sure honestly they all lived very long ridiculously long lives but he was 90 years old uh when he had his first kid you know really and i think it was really just because like uh i think where that's where the story really began you know uh all the abrahamic religions to what we have with modern day Muslim Christianity and Judaism, it all stemmed right then and there from this guy. And uh, he had, he had kids and uh, wife, Sarah, um, he ended up having uh, two kids, um, Ishmael and Isaac. Right. And, uh, Isaac, I believe actually ended up having uh, two kids and I'm pretty sure that's where it, that's where things start to get a little hectic. So uh, isn't it, isn't Abraham uh, the guy that he, God tells him he's got to kill one of them. Isn't that the deal? Or am I thinking of somebody yeah. else? Yeah, that was Isaac. So basically, uh, that that's that's a symbolic story that lives in history as a parallel to the sacrifice that God was going to make to his only son. Um, but just to trust the basically the process, because Abraham, uh, <laughs> Abraham, <laughs> Are you in Philadelphia. So that's the first instance of trust. <laughs> that was that's awesome. So basically, it's just like this is the that's first. So awesome. Was, no, it was. It's like God first, said, trust the process. That's too good. <laughs> yeah, it, I, and this is like the part where it gets all like where it gets crazy because it's a good like, thing. It's a good thing it, Isaac it, wasn't in Philadelphia. He'd been screwed, right? Oh, <laughs> Philly, Philadelphia, or the movie Philadelphia? No, no, no. In Philly, isn't that that's where they told him because they were losing all those games and they're like, trust the process. Trust the process. You know, it's it's long, but yeah, <laughs> it's, I think the I think the the real lesson, like I think with that story, is that. Uh, I was going to say something even cool, like uh, it, it's a, it's re it's relatable for actors because a lot of it doesn't become, I think, believable until we could sort of actually uh, act it in a certain way, unless oh, cool. we're actually performing the actual process. So that's what I meant before. It's just like, imagine like, you know, um, a guy who dies for you and then comes back. Uh, the parallel to that was prior to that is that God was the one that said to Abraham, now I know I can trust you because he was about to do it. And I think that was just sort of like a point where he was creating sort of like a almost a, a theatrical uh, event because he maybe would have allowed him to kill him and then just would have resurrected him right there just to prove a point that he's God. But I don't right. think that would have been the point of how to trust him because he's not going to allow you to hurt others or put yourself sure. in danger. But he did want you to, I think, just believe that I think 
he know like there's there's more to that i think it's i think it created like if you get really scientific it created some sort of epigenetic code um because their names actually have specific definitions in hebrew uh, which actually i like i am the like each from the time jesus i think or noah was born i think it was david where it stops um there's 14 lines of lineage and their definitions of their names actually spell out a full sentence so uh, that's so basically, like I, Adam, which is man, uh, sacrifice, uh, uh, revive, all of these little names, all the way down uh, to Noah, they all they all so cool. have a they all have a sentence in the name, which is really interesting because it's like here we are on Earth for X amount of time, but sort of like uh, the poetic part. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah. It's almost like the space between the letters that make up a sentence is basically our breath because it's so brief of our, of our time on Earth. Right. It's literally like uh, there's this whole other story being written that we can't see, you know? That's so cool. So how do you know about all this? Is this standard like Hebrew school stuff that everyone learns? Or you seem like you know a lot about this. I know a lot about a lot of things. Uh, and <laughs> You're just smart. I love that. Yeah, because no, we're on there and I'm like, I remember like, because my dad was a huge Bob Dylan fan, speaking of Bob Dylan. And there's a line in there where he says, you know, God said, I think it's Highway 61 or one of his really old songs. He says, you know, God said to Abraham, kill me a son. Abraham said, you, God, you must be putting me on. Right. And, and so oh, I'm like, God. wait, that's the, it's got to be the one. Like, that's all. I mean, I have not that's a lot of religious guy. training. Same like, exact so I did Google it. I did look it up. Actually, I did. I, I will say I did some research. I didn't remember. And I certainly did not have your level of depth. Even <laughs> yes, in sorry, you understand Bob Dylan, but you had no idea who the hell he was singing about, which happened to be the guy that started it all. Trust. Well, the I didn't realize that he actually Abraham. Like I knew he was one of the dudes, but I didn't realize that he actually is credited with starting the Jewish religion. Am I saying that wrong? Uh, pretty, pretty close to it. Uh, it's honestly, I'm not I can't really even give like uh, him that much credit. Uh, because uh, Judaism didn't exist up until the time of uh, Noah didn't exist. Okay, so, so actually, in, no, I could be wrong. I think maybe Abraham came after Noah, and uh, then yeah, oh yeah, um, Abraham came way after Noah. We already had modern day society and stuff. So yes, he was actually day one of Judaism. So okay, so just, yes. just at risk of you know angering you know religious people everywhere and just in the spirit of admitting really stupid vain actor things, the assistant director's like, yeah, you know, you're going to be like Moses or Abraham. And I was like, I'd seen the 10 commandments. I thought Charlton Heston was awesome. And, oh, yeah. you know, and so like, I literally, <laughs> I literally at one point, and it's, it, I don't think I actually had a choice, but I thought I had a choice. Like the way he said it was like, I might have a choice. And so I literally Googled, which is better. It's like when you go coffee shops near me, I went, I, I literally Googled, <laughs> Who got the better the of, which is better, Abraham, <laughs> who's better, Abraham or Moses? <laughs> so yeah, and that's, I should, probably, up. I should probably not have admitted. How, no. And I got this very, <laughs> I found this very uh, cogent article about, well, you know, Moses did this and that, but Abraham's really credited being the father of the origin. And I'm like, oh, okay. All right. I'm good. All right. That, I'll go Abraham. This just sounds, sounds like the right guy. So yeah, I got to give him that amount of credit. Uh, I, I I am Jewish technically by blood, but no, nah, I like uh, I grew up, I grew up uh, in church. Uh, I was a, I became a born again Christian like when I was fourteen years old. Ah. Now, now I'm an actor, and basically I, the Story Filmmakers Club is my church. Ah, sweet. Yeah, excellent. At least that's how it looks like on uh, paper. It's uh, awesome. Technically, that's it's cool. a church, but no, nah, this is this is filmmaking. This is the love. Of, this is the love of the art. That's awesome. So do you guys sponsor making films too out there in Astoria? Uh, we have on, I've seen you on backstage casting things. So you guys, right. I mean, are you making films yeah. too? Or? We are like, we actually had a couple of nice little base hits this year. Um, nice. Like the pandemic was a huge setback. I'm sure. Yeah. As you know, but uh, uh, honestly, we made up so much ground um, where it seems like the pandemic, I could say it happened, but f for the amount of growth we've had in the last couple of months, it made up the difference. Like I'm, I'm really shocked and impressed. Uh, technically we have the ability to be the fiscal sponsor of any form of independent film anywhere. Uh, we, we could, uh, be a, uh, fundraising resource for, or a build your own grant resource. Um, there's a lot of different directions and services that, this type of a nonprofit could really do for the artist and the uh, artist community. Um, we have 
a writer's room where we're actually putting together people's scripts, giving them feedback to achieve what it is they're looking to do. Uh, we have some ideas for original stories that have not even started yet. And uh, all the actors, for the most part, that we have involved, um, we've been asking them to come on board, uh, uh, read for this role. And if we hit our budget and actually get all the money, they audition, they either get the job or it's up to the writer director, sure. you know, How and fun. we get we no, it's collaborative. We keep we, awesome. everybody gets involved. It's uh, you know, no man left behind. <laughs> that's that's excellent. So and you have film festivals, too, you said. The Triborough Film Festival, yeah, uh, that's that's something I I had on my heart to do even before the pandemic started. It's just like yeah, I guess it just wasn't time. So uh, to me, I always wanted to know like uh, what's like the film festival to go to like in New York. And I've yeah, been to yeah. it. Like I've been to the Tribeca Film Festival. I, I got to, I got to experience it. It was fun. Uh, my friend JJ, who I mentioned earlier, he had a movie I think called Friday in that festival. So we got to check it out and did a fantastic job. Shout out JJ. Uh, there was also, of course, like a Astoria film festival, the Queens world film festival, just getting the taste, but um, it didn't quite really connect with people who were actually like really from here and like had the yeah. drive. So that's where the AFC really helped begin. But I wanted to actually see now that we got to the point where after all these years, the AFC has all of these abilities. I wonder who in this area, especially the five boroughs, who's got talent, like who, like who's like, who's good. Yeah, so yeah. that was literally uh, a space where we could actually showcase each other's work, watch nice. it and uh, provide, provide the recognition uh, appropriately, you know, cause these guys are good. You know, the, the people who came into the tri-borough this year, um, we had 53 submissions, uh, I think we actually showed either 41. I think it was 41. I'm almost certain. Uh, they were outstanding, man. We had 17 hours of film to show and I uh, got us into the Zucker theater at uh, Kaufman studios. Uh, we had our first award ceremony and uh, we even started uh, our, our own Oscar ceremony called the Astor awards. How fun. That's awesome. Oh, it, no, it was a blast dude. And uh, a lot of people came a decent amount. Like there was over, 160 people came to watch the movies and then 80 people had shown up to the award ceremony. No, that's great. How fun. It was fun. It was a well, blast. So Nick is where does Nick say he lived? He is in, I think I want to say Brooklyn or maybe he was in, he lives in Manhattan. Is, do you guys take Manhattan night stuff? You, you could, you could, you could screen daily city when it's done. I think it'll be done in like four. I mean, he's got to go to post now. Oh, like if it, like he's a director, right? Yeah. He's director and wrote it. So that's like that. The only qualification to get into the Triborough literally is uh, cast. Uh, a cast member has to either be born, raised, or live in New York. Yeah. Uh, the producer, director, writer, like the crew guys, they either have to have been uh, born, raised, or live in New York, or the story itself has to be set in New York. If you I hit, you. if you hit any of those three, you're in. Yeah, because he's from there, and then and then Clara, the AD, who was awesome. She also she was just running the show. She was amazing. She lives in Manhattan, so those those they're both New Yorkers. And then I mean, it's set in San Francisco. Daily City is actually a real city in San Francisco, out just outside San Francisco. But I think it would resonate. I mean, I, I think you guys would like it. It's a very, I mean, you guys have the exact same thing. You have the immigrants on Film Freeway, man. Like we like we're open to the public on Film Freeway. You look up the Triborough, you'll see our ratings, our reviews. Yeah, uh, maybe some trailers. I'm not sure what the public gets to see, but uh, we're we, we're on Instagram, too. We're kind of legit. <laughs> you should get Nick to come on your podcast. I mean, because he's a good guy. He's a great guy. He just wrote this thing. It's been his kind of like his baby. Right. I mean, he, it's, his, it's his personal story. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've been getting to know so many people by doing this podcast. Like uh, it's, it's open to anybody, you know, and that's what I have, honestly, just like the sign up sheet. It's really easy just to yeah get involved. Uh, I'll always make the time. Um, I got plenty of free time being an unemployed actor. So <laughs> that's it. You gotta, you know, you gotta do something. That's awesome. And it is, you know what, it's really a clubhouse, you know, it's like kids in the neighborhood, literally getting together at the clubhouse, working on cool stuff. Yep. 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 And keep the playful part alive. Yeah, no, I was, who was, that? I was listening to a podcast of the guys that made super bad and they're like, yeah, we were just going to make it with like iPhones if we couldn't get money. Yeah. That would have been, I don't know. No, gonna make it in their backyard. You know what I mean? I'm glad they got money because uh, Superbad was a fantastic film. Is that a true story? 
That's what I heard. That's what I can't remember which one of them said it, but they were like, they'd been working on it for a while and they weren't getting traction. And they're like, fuck it, we'll just make it ourselves. Can I ask a silly question? Because sure. uh, I have seen this movie and just getting to know you a little bit and just like your style, uh, everything. Well, what was it about the movie Smoke Signals that uh, was one of your favorite films? So uh, I just loved, I just loved that it was such a small story. You know what I mean? And it's so universal. I mean, number one, it's a story about people you don't really see stories from Native Americans. You know what I mean? First and foremost. Yeah, we don't see anything. And it, I don't know. It was one of those movies. I saw it. It was in the 90s. And I had a lot of issues with my dad and my dad didn't leave. It's a story about a dad. It's a story about a guy. I don't know if you've seen smoke signals, but I have. Yeah. Or, yeah. The dad kid. leaves. And so then, and he finds out that his dad dies. So it's sort of a journey of discovery. Like why did dad leave? Dad doesn't love us. And so, you know, for people that have had rocky relationship with dads, which apparently based on all these bad dad roles, I've been playing at one point. It's funny during two bits. I raised my, I'm the kid who's falling apart. I, I just raised my hand. I said, does everyone have a fucked up relationship with their dads? All the kids are like, yep. Yep. I'm like, God damn. And so I remember being in that theater at the end and the very end, remember when he's on the bridge and there's the voiceover of that, there's a voiceover of a poem called, how can we forgive our fathers? And I remember sitting in that theater with my wife and, you know, being a macho man, I'm not going to cry. I remember seeing that theater. She's like, do you want to go? And the credits rolling. I thought if I move a muscle, I'm just gonna start crying right now. I don't know why I, I'm like, I can't move. I just have to sit here for like five minutes to collect myself. I, I, I just had this feeling like if I get up and start walking, I'm just going to start crying. Like it just hit me so hard, his connection with his dad and the grief. And I was just like, damn. Um, and I just thought if you can make a movie like that for whatever that costs to make, and cause it's such a good story, it doesn't matter what the budget. I was just like, I remember that at that moment thinking, and I was not doing anything with movies. I was in corporate bullshit. And I was just like, damn, I wish I was making movies. Mm -hmm. is to tell that story at least it affected me so much do you know what i mean sure and, you know there's no car chases there's no no, no the cars had to drive backwards because the gear didn't cars work. had to drive backwards exactly yeah. it was just such a sweet story and it was so well acted and i just thought you know if you made no money but you made that film you're just winning yeah that's uh honestly that's that's an accomplishment I, that's what i meant before like as far as success versus accomplishment that right, right. there is an accomplishment, you know, because right. it's th th that's something you could actually be proud of, you know, because yeah. in some ways uh, in other movies. anybody could make Star Wars seven. I mean, maybe not Star Wars one, because that did that was groundbreaking. It started it all. But like you or I could be some role in Star Wars 15 or whatever it's going to be. And it would do a billion dollars. And right? I know right now it's becoming sort of like it, it seems like it's it's being prostituted now a little bit like you got to exactly. Let it you got to no. stop. Like we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're ripping it. We're hurting it now. Well, it's funny. Cause my, my, uh, I know someone who works for, for worked for Lucas and then they got bought. And I'm like, what the hell is Disney going to do with the star Wars franchise? I mean, it's done. They've made the movies and he just looks at me and goes, you ever heard of Mickey mouse? Right. I mean, they've been milking Mickey mouse for what? 80 years, 70 years. And I, I, he just, that's all he said. And I was like, and look, oh. at, look at this is like 10 years ago. He's like, have you ever heard of Mickey mouse? They and it's like, literally, Oh my God. And look at how they've milked it. The Mandalorian, the, this, the, that, you know, Yoda is a young man. Yoda makes porn. You know, what's next? You know what I mean? It's like, I think um, that might actually come back and really haunt him because, uh, or not. You know, 80 years from now, your great, great grandchildren are going to be watching some fucking Star Wars thing. Just the same way that three-year-olds today, new, th newly minted three-year-olds have Mickey Mouse ears, you know, when you go to Disneyland. So it's well, aside, fr aside from that, uh, you know, I grew up, of course, I love, I love the parks growing up. Um, I think just the corporate part of it is actually really going to take and really going to get hurt really bad because the, the measure of creativity and original is, uh, not going to be there quite as well as it was yeah. because we're not the ones actually now contributing and actually sh being shown our work because like I saw the documentary when George Lucas uh, uh, was a guest star and he uh, mentioned when he was like uh, six or seven years old on opening day, he got to go to Disneyland for the first time. And that's where like all really did start for him. Oh yeah. And there was, there's been just very few couple movies about what, uh, you know, Walt Disney himself was like when he was yeah a younger. Um, Mr. Banks was just one movie where you got to see Tom Hanks as 
uh, or saving Mr. Banks, uh, right, the story right. of Mary Poppins. Um, but uh, there was another one uh, from the kid from uh, uh, he was in, he was in American Pie, but he also was in uh, like the baseball movie, like uh, in the major leagues or something like that. Because yeah, that, yeah, yeah. like an eleven year old kid that got to pitch in the major leagues because he broke his arm, and then all of a sudden he could pitch. Oh, uh, got you. Yeah, he yeah. also played uh, Walt Disney. Uh, I think with I want to say Napoleon Dynamite's uh, the actor, right, right, as uh, the other Disney brother on how Disney really became what it was. And uh, I think at one point, uh, maybe in our future, Disney is going to become Felix the cat. And there's going to be this new idea that they're just going to completely overlook until it's way too late. Yeah. Disney has the power to buy out, but, and that's right. the thing. Um, even like you're, you're not, you, you are buying them as properties and assets, but you it's almost like you're, um, you're fostering children that are not your own, you know? Right. Like that you're going to be able to raise them and do good things and they're going to do good things, but you, there's going to be, there's going to come a point where your ancestry is going to completely stop. It, I mean, it does. That's what I thought. And they just sort of, seem, I mean, it's funny. I have this argument with younger people. I'm like, guys, you got your generation needs to make something. You got to stop remaking films that were made when I was a kid. You know what I mean? That's, that's exactly my point. You know, we're not seeing the, uh, we're not seeing the original, the originality anymore. I mean, I can't, I mean, I know this is going to sound like the Very old guy, but like, I can't see another Marvel movie. You know, it's like, you can't see another Spider-Man origin story. I mean, I was collecting <laughs> Spider-Mans when I was a little kid. We all know it. He gets bit. We all know the uncle dies, but you know what I mean? We get it. He has to choose between having power and having fun and responsibility. And it's sad that his uncle died. We get it. We get it. We all know we don't need to see it again. You're telling me, but you wouldn't go, you wouldn't go watch uh, the origin story of Thanos. <laughs> I would love to a contribute to that, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, that would be, yeah, that's true. That's true. That would be kind of cool. You know, I, yeah. I would like something like that. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I just like, mean like, I mean, I guess when I was a kid, all that stuff was new and it's like, okay, well there's gotta be, there's gotta be other. Yeah. Stuff, you know? Well, you know what I think the biggest problem is, uh, is uh, uh, taking your measure of success too seriously at a young age um, because uh, Stan Lee, he created all the Marvels, right? Right. So he didn't actually, I think, publish his first comic book of anything he made uh, until he was 39 years old. Oh, I know. And, and a lot think, of that stuff came when he was like in his 50s. The real, like when he started feeling like a kid yeah. again. Was like he, I like, think that when he started Marvel at like 55, I think they kicked him out of DC or he left DC and he made Marvel. Gotcha. Yeah. So he was old. Like, I I think maybe now we're uh, we're coming. I don't know if it's a matter of economics and just like the way our country's going, but you know it, we're we're in a real disposition of survival because we can't afford to live anywhere and use our imagination because it seems like we're always in this like constant anxious state of mind where creativity is just not flowing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anxiety definitely is is the the new sort of pandemic of of people like under 30 ish. You know what I mean? Like everyone seems to be suffering and maybe we did too. We just didn't call it that, but it just seems so prevalent now. And then you're right. And when you're anxious, you can't create. No, you're not thinking you can create when you're nervous. You just need to prepare more and do your thing. And sometimes you just need to kick your ass out there on stage. But if you're just got that weird, ang you know, that weird buzz in your head, it's really hard to, I find to create something. And you're right. Like if you've got that buzz going, so how do you get rid of that? I don't, I don't know rest uh i've noticed like in my process of now just taking a back seat or just like kind of like taking a look at of you know maybe some of the accomplishments where i can kind of appreciate the things that i've done thus far um yeah. a lot of creativity especially i gotta you can't see it but i do actually have sort of like a, a vision board uh on my wall uh my uh one of my coaches recommended i try doing that but uh all of these little graphics and images of movies uh they didn't, they, it's not like I sat down and planned out each and every one in like a certain amount of time it, my, for me and my brain. I, I don't know if it's just me, but a lot of the things I come up with and think of, they come in waves and sometimes, yeah. random. you know, like they're very random, but I write them down. And did you ever have that? Like you wake up and you're like, if you could just hit print on what's in your brain, it would be freaking perfect. Yes. You know I mean? You'd have a short story. Like in other words, it's all there. And you're just not quite awake. And it's like, even the phrase, like I'll wake up with a phrase and, and, and I'm sometimes write them down. Sometimes I don't, but like, I just, there's, you get that and you're like, oh, it's right there. There's the whole, there's the whole arc. And then yeah. about half an hour later, you're like, wait, where did that go? 
you that's I mean? the funniest thing about, it, especially when you wake up, because I'm definitely not a morning person. Uh, I, it takes a lot for me to actually get the momentum, but you know, once I get yeah. going, you know, still, I'm like a, I'm like a, I'm like a slow walking elephant during the day. I'm just kind of like cruising, you know, I'm not going a thousand miles. I'm not, the, I'm not the duck feet under the pond. I'm, I'm the big elephant. Are you, are you more night person? Do you, do you, is that when you start getting rolling? Sometimes where it's just like, you know, I feel like I'm ready to do more throughout the day, but then all of a sudden it's like my puppy's asleep and it's like, I should be winding down. Um, I'm excited. Um, at a certain point at the end of the day, uh, this past couple of months, because I'm actually really taking in like, uh, what's on its way. And yeah. I feel like I, I I'm preparing constantly for the things that are, uh, up and coming. So, Yeah. And uh, just sometimes to wind down, if I'm home, I like I used to go to the bar a lot, but now that I got a puppy, I barely go out anymore. I'm kind of just like becoming more of like a stay at home dad. <laughs> You're getting old. <laughs> yeah, you know, at 36 years old, you think you should, uh, you know, you know, don't uh, don't go out as often as you did. Yeah, it's not as it's not as productive. Yeah. Hey, even even going to the bar, staying home, you know what I mean. It is it is easy to be unproductive. I think, sp- especially since the pandemic, it's like, ah, let me have another drink. It's Wednesday. I worked my I, I was an essential worker during the pandemic. Oh, you, you know? were. Uh... Yeah, with a back injury that I barely knew truly what like the severity of it was. It, it was a mess. Ouch. What were you What were you doing? I was working uh, at Costco during the pandemic. Oh yeah. Jeez. That must've been a, that must've been interesting. It was the epicenter of the, of the, the pandemic and uh, Queens was uh, getting destroyed. And of course Uh, everybody's coming to get their food and I get to be in that same building and room the entire time. So you don't think I'm worried to go home to my wife. Uh, Yeah. I'm going to be a little, I'm going to be able to be a little bit nervous, like taking all my clothes off outside in Uh, the garage, you know, stuff like that. (laughs) Like, I mean, this is me protecting you <laughs> spraying bleach on the groceries you know what i mean when they that was the scariest part because i uh, did a little bit of uh instacart and, uh, and i would actually drop food off every single like item of lysol was getting sprayed uh, uh on the deck when i was like it was it was it was a sight to see it was actually really scary it was and we did it, it. Overkill. I mean, it was so bad i know and and then it turns out like, yeah, surfaces aren't that big of a deal. It's really the, your breath. Put your damn mask on. And I remember at the very beginning going, wait, what's the number one thing you see in a hospital with all the doctors when they're operating? Masks. Didn't Doesn't that seem like a thing that, you know, it's got to be that. And I was like, no, it's not. It's it's surfaces. Like, really? Uh, it's so dumb. Uh, maybe in 100 years, they'll uh, figure it out and saying how they could have done things just a little bit better. Yeah. Well, you go back. Have you ever seen any of those pictures from the twenties? They're wearing masks. There's a picture. There's a couple pictures I've seen of guys playing baseball, like major league baseball with masks on. Oh, after the Spanish flu. Yes. So they knew back then we just went, we went bananas this, you know, this time. I I mean, we're talking about millions of people dying, you know, like millions of people. I remember when it passed. Now it's just the flu. It's not even the Spanish flu anymore. Now it's just evolved into the flu. Exactly. Yeah. Ugh. Just have to let my dog out. She's uh, it's cool. Getting anxious. She did a good job today. She met uh like five or six new dogs today. Took them ah, to the dog. little dog bonding. I love it. It was nice, and we had a couple hours. Uh, I mentioned to it on a previous podcast, but did I tell you about the fire that happened today? You did. Yeah, at the beginning, he's like okay, massive. Yeah. Yeah. So like, uh, every, like, uh, somebody had just texted me now, some sort of field reporter. So the footage I got is going to be on channel 12 news. Oh, cool. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I was literally just like, uh, telling my neighbors, like, well, I'll get you more information if I find out. And I was only there because I was still <laughs> like, like, might as well film like it. you know, I'm, I'm an actor. I can do voiceover on that. on that footage. If you need it, do you want me to drop in a little description? <laughs> Knowing, knowing after the facts that everybody got out safe, one fire, uh, no, no serious injuries. Like right. every, everybody's good. House yeah. is gone. Like the house is gone, but oh, all right. Yuck. That's all right. Um, and I do, and I do horse riding, uh, right down the street from that house too. Oh, do you? Yeah. I got into everything that I've always wanted to do, but never had the time to do it. So now I am just doing it. I rode horses when I was a kid. Oh, that, uh, that was my thing is riding horses. Everybody I work out with at the gym, like uh, I do mixed martial arts and they all ride motorcycles and I got my like permit, but 
I don't know. I just don't see myself like really riding. I love my electric scooter. Like I'll cruise yeah. on up, but nah, I like, I'd rather pull up and ride a horse than, you know, drive a car. That's cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm weird like that. I just, I do things that nobody else does or yeah. not. The, no, nah, I'm, I'm not exactly uh, going with the flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's good skill though, too, right? A little Western, little, you know what I mean? Oh, well, that's true too. Like uh, these guys more or less train equestrian and I learned so much about the sport and, you know, and that's the cool thing about when you get out there, there's so much, there's so much more that you learn and the, like uh, different techniques, different styles, uh, how athletic and strong you get fry just from riding in certain techniques. It's very, oh, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. Are you doing English or Western? Uh, technically, it, well, this one's English. Uh, I have done Western when I was a kid and I was given a really cool saddle as a gift, but, uh, no, I just hadn't ridden in so long. I want to try something, I guess, new. And, uh, I technically, I think I'm the only guy who does it. So it's, uh, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to be around that environment. Well, it's funny when I was, so I was like, oh, stop. I gotta take that. No, no. I just turned my phone off. Sorry about that. Um, oh. When I was a kid, I did, um, I did writing and um, stop. My son's bugging me. Um, yeah. And I remember like, at first it was like, I just really liked it. My mom did it and it was like, Oh, you're good at it. You know what I mean? And it was like, Oh, I wasn't that good at sports. Like kind of like, I'm good at this. That's cool. So I started going to these horse shows and at first my brother teased me. And so then he went with, with one to me and he's two years older than me. And I was probably 12. And we show up there and he's looking around. There's all these girls in a little tight little riding outfits. He's like, oh, damn, we're the only guys here. So then he's like, I want to do this too. So he completely used it as a vehicle to meet girls. That was absolutely like, he was a decent rider because he we, we had a bunch of horses. We, we lived in a kind of a suburban rural area. And my mom was super into it. So he was a decent rider, but he absolutely had one goal. In <laughs> I was trying to like win ribbons and stuff. He's like, yeah, I don't really know. I need to do that, but I need to talk to her, you know? Oh, that sounds like a good short film. Yeah. <laughs> That's fun. The, the horse show. Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah, he, he definitely um, got engaged in it via the girl, the girl part of it. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. That'd be a good, you, call, you could call it Spurs or something like that. Spurs. Yeah. <laughs> Burn, burning Spurs. There, there's, a, there's, there's, there's many horse name, you know, related names that all sound like porno movies, right? Bareback. Yeah, you know? No, I mean, you're right. Saddle up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be funny though. I did actually want to do like a horseback riding film like 10 years ago. I just can't remember the name. It was like, it, it, I had the plot, you know, I probably wrote it down in my old computer and I'll find it, but it was, uh, yep. I, it did have a really cool name. I, I forget, I forget it though. That's not, that's awesome. That's funny. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole world. The horseback riding, the whole, sh you know, going to shows that is its own scene. A yeah, hundred years ago, everybody was familiar with it, you know, uh, yep. sports, we didn't have cars, we didn't have anything else. So we really just like stuck with horses, make games out of it. You can still got the track, you got the trotters, uh, that was our transportation, everything, you know, was uh, horse related. So where do you ride? I don't think of New York and riding and, you know, I, I'm thinking of, you obviously don't live in, in, you know, a city. Or, or a, we got, I like, I heard a story in a rumor. It's not even a rumor. There's photos. Like you got a guy in Brooklyn who has a horse, like it's almost unheard of. Uh, Long Island uh, has ranches in Long Island. Yeah. Um, uh, they even got wineries in Long Island. Uh, up in the Catskills, you have tens of thousands of horses and cattle upstate, you know, like they're, sure. like, it's a, uh, you know, and uh, actually uh, one thing I'll be going to Albany, uh, in a couple of weeks to, uh, with the chamber of commerce for Queens in a couple of weeks. Um, it's my understanding that agriculture is like one of the number one, like, uh, uh, exports of the state, um, between the beer we make and the wine that we produce and, uh, the apples, uh, the onions, yeah. like a lot of little niches actually is a huge, like a huge, uh, moneymaker and horses are a part of that. You know, there, this is a, like farmland, uh, green County further upstate in the Catskill mountains. Yeah. That's the, that it, it was so green, you know, and it was, you could see uh, before you even, uh, hit parts of the Appalachian trail and the Anirondack mountains, right. all that, like there's horses everywhere that people ride here. 
And uh, well, the I land- if, I, if I'm out in New York, I, we got to go riding. I, I, I've only ridden a couple of times, like in the last, you know, 20 years. And I, I mean, I, I used to ride like every day when I was a kid. Oh, definitely. You do, so you're more Western. So I know I took, I did both. I started Western just cause we had horses and it got, I had this beautiful Western saddle and then I started doing English. So I did jumping and all that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So I learned oh, how to post and yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had to do all of that change leads with de- de- depending on which direction you're going, all that crap. God, no, I'm sure like, what, was it hard for you to kind of transition from one st- uh, technique to the other? You know, not that hard. Not really. It, it seemed, yeah. I mean, it wasn't that too difficult. You know what I mean? It seems um, a little bit more challenging and complicated um, English style when you have, uh, I think Western is a little bit, if you could, like, I think that's the easier way to jump if you go from Western into English. Yeah. I could be a little biased. Like I'm not, I'm not the best writer experience writer, but I don't know. Like if you can understand the tango uh, it's a lot more different than starting from there and then learning like the box step and or the foxtrot. Yeah. And I never did anything with Western. Like I never roped a calf or something where you're actually using that saddle and the horn for what it's for. So it was just mostly just trail riding and cruising around. Whereas the English was, was almost all, you know, ring riding and technique and keeping your heels in and keeping your hands in a certain place, you know, for points. Right. Exactly. You know, do, doing those shows. I don't give a two. I don't give two nothings about that. You know, I just love being one yeah. with the horse riding. And it just feels great. And like, uh, making sure I don't fall off. And, um, honestly, I'm trying to get on Yellowstone. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that would be awesome. I would love that. That would be total badass. I would love to do something, but I don't know. I just like, it's hard. Like, I don't know where I would really fit in that world. Uh, you could be like the new guy from New York, you know, and, and like, they give you a lot of shit cause they don't think you can fit in, but then you'd have to be able to like rope a cow really well or something like that. You know what I mean? I would, I would punch, I would actually punch the cow in the face and knock it out like from blazing saddles. And it's like, <laughs> Oh yeah, it's going to fit in just fine. Well, that's uh, now you're talking about the greatest movie ever made. I saw that movie when I was a kid. And it's like, they'll never make a funnier movie than that. I remember thinking that like, this is just, you can, this, they might as well just stop. We could just see uh, this movie every day. And then Don DeLuise is on a completely different set and uh, they're just like hijacking and the fight just carries all over. Mel Brooks was, uh, pro- and God, God bless him and his life. Like he's almost, he's got to be close to like 98, 99. He's still alive. I know he's still alive. It's unbelievable. He's, he's still got a best. sense of humor. He is the best. I remember just like there, there's, and like, it's not like, I, I don't like this kind of humor now, but I just remember as a kid, like I just couldn't believe you could make a movie that had farting in it. Like, how is that possible? Oh, with the beans? Oh, everything? my God. I was just thinking, like, there's just, you can't, you can't get a funnier scene than that. I just remember at 13 or 14, like, you can't get a funnier scene than that. It's just done. It's just that they did it in a tasteful way where it's supposed to be funny and it made sense right. the way they did it. Right, right, right. That's too funny. Well, that's awesome. Well, this has been awesome, man. It's fine. No. really been good yeah. catching up I, I you know if you want i can send nick a note you should interview him he just finished his film and he's editing and follow him on his path to to get it out in festivals daily city 100 percent. uh i'll i would love i'd love to talk to him love to meet him and i'll definitely send you more information when we talk more on email i gotta say thank you so much for coming on the show uh it's been a it's been a real delight getting to know you your journey better like your background everything and if you do come out to new york yeah dude we're going riding Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely to no, know back at you. It's been super fun. I really appreciate it. It's 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 been really good. Usually before we wrap up um, every podcast, uh, we always have like a little bit of a closing, uh, like a closing statement. And um, when I first started out, uh, I always read this book, uh, like off to the side on stage uh, when I wasn't actually working or anything yep. like that. I'd be reading this book constantly, especially in the beginning. Uh, it was called The Right Words at the Right Time by Marcy Hopkins. Uh, Marcy Thompson at the time, but um, she uh, did a collective of interviews and com- uh, consolidated them all into this book. And uh, all of these celebrities, athletes, they all yeah. had some sort of words of wisdom that they were given. And uh, they were always the right words at the right time. And it it, it was always different for every single uh, subject. And my yep. question uh, to you was up until this point in your life, um, has anybody ever said, uh, something along the lines of the right words at the right time that have just stuck with you after all these years? Or if not, do you have any uh, words of wisdom of your own? So let's see. So when I was younger, 
post a lot of trauma. I think that I had, I, I, I saw a shrink for a while. It's really old guy. And one of his favorite things to say, because I'd be like, you know, you know, I'm just late. I'm just this, I'm just that I'm not smart. I'm not, you know, whatever it is. And he'd be like his, he, he'd be like, you are what you do, you know? And he's like, and, and his big thing was do what's indicated. Like if you're, you're laying there and you think I should do that, I need to do that, do it. And his thing was like, if you're late all the time, figure out why you're not late, stop being late. And you're not a person who's late. He's, you are what you do, right? If, if you overeat all the time, if you drink too much, you're going to be a drunk. If you, if you're late all the time, you know, or, and po- I mean, these are negative examples, but if you get up and you work out, you're an athlete. You know what I mean? You are what you do. And it seems so simple. I heard someone say this the other day, they, uh, a singer, she said, you know, I just watch what my hands are doing. I make note of what my hands are doing, meaning what am I doing? Not like physically actually watching her hands, but like, just, I note what I'm doing. And that kind of dovetailed in that thought of like, you are what you do. And you can't avoid that. You can think you want to be different, but like you actually have to do it. You know what I'm saying? Like if you want to act, you got to act. You want to write, you got to write. You know what I'm saying? And then you'll be a writer. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so it's always easy to be like, well, I, you know, I want to be that, but then you're actually not doing it. So like you're acting, you're podcasting, we're just trying to do it. So that, that, that was, that, those were words that always stuck with me. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You are what you do. Absolutely. I mean, it's simple. Right. And, but his, his other yeah. axiom, he, he had a lot of them. His other axiom was, he would say, I'd be like, well, that's so simple. And he would say, yeah, truth is simple. Yo. Yeah. So <laughs> that is true. <laughs> right. And he'd be like, and it's, you know, you think you're going to have a big revelation and you're like, shit, I just need to leave the house five minutes earlier. So I arrive five minutes earlier. So I'm not anxious. So I get out of my car. I, I can go to the bathroom. I can take a drink of water. And then man, the audition went way better. And even if I don't get the role, I felt better about how I did because I was early. I felt good. I felt like I had a little second to do my little hair or whatever it is that I feel like I need to do, you know, make sure my fly is up, whatever it is that makes me not anxious. And it's like, I went out and killed. They didn't give it to me because like in Daily City, I, you know, when you see the film, the guy that they chose is like very heavy set, bald head. And like you, you and I, he and I stand next together and like, we're not in the same lane. Right. So they closed their eyes. They thought of him. I could have, I could have auditioned like Lawrence freaking Olivier and I'm not getting the part because they closed their eyes and they saw him. Sure. You know what I mean, absolutely. And so, but I felt good about what I did. And then they called me back and gave me a small role. They're like, we loved your audition. We didn't think you're right, but we want you to be one of the two car sales guys. So, so you basically, you won the room. Right. Cause yeah. I felt good about it, you know? And so, and so, you know, I don't know. That's some, and it's, I mean, trust me, it's super hard to enact those things. You know, I'm making it sound like it's easy. Truth is simple. You are what you do. It's really hard to get yourself to do what you should be doing. But that was something that was said to me, you know, and he, that was his other thing. He'd always be like, well, do what's indicated. Like, I'm not sure what to do. And he's like, do what's indicated. I'm like, well, how do you know? And he's like, trust your gut. This really, you know, you'll know, like you really are honest with yourself. You know, God damn it. I should do that. I should call my brother. Cause I said this and he said that, or I should, get up five minutes or I should leave to the airport 10 minutes earlier. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or whatever it is, you know, if you, you know, you're little, he's always like, there's a voice that's telling you what to do. You're just not listening. Yeah. So anyway, That's my, that's my, that's my one minute primer. I've given you like four answers. So sorry. I've, I've given you way more answers than you wanted, but. No, not at all, dude. Cause uh, there is somebody listening to this right now who want, who needed to hear that, you know, well, he's a wise old dude. And and in fact, because we grew up in Marin to loop it back to our other conversation, I always had this theory that maybe he saw George Lucas because he came up all his little phrases were so much like Yoda. And I was like, dude, you have something to do with this. You're fucking Yoda. You are, you're, you're giving him these little, because some of the things, you know, like try not, there is no try. He would always say that it's like, what's trying like, well, I'm trying to this. He's like, you just need to do it. Like, yeah. and I'm like, so then when Star Wars, I'm like, you, you know, you and Yoda sound a lot alike. And he was old. He was like 80 and 85. He was an old dude. I'm like, you've seen, are you seeing George Lucas? And he's dead silence. Did no words. Wouldn't, didn't, deny, never denied it though. So it's possible. Well, I, there's no way he did not see Star Wars. <laughs> no, but I'm saying, I thought he saw George Lucas. I thought maybe Lucas was taking some of their discussions and sticking oh, dude, it. Now I see what you're saying. Because like, what he was saying was so... He, no, he'd never seen Star Wars. No idea. That I it's hard to believe. And so we actually, there was a few of us that saw him. We used to call him Yoda. It's like, oh, you see Yoda this week? 
right? Like when he's in the thing and he lifts the Millennium Falcon and he's like, I'm, I'm trying. And he goes, try not, there is no try. I mean, my God, he'd never say those exact words, but that I'm like, oh my God, that's him. You were right there. Like uh, not to get all OCD about it. He's like, don't try, do or do not. There is no try. Exactly. And that's what Selsom used to say to me all the time. He like, he hated it when people would say, well, I'm committed to doing this. He's like, you're just making space for yourself not to do it. That's fair. That's right? like, I'm committed to calling you back next week. If I, that's not the same thing as me saying, Hey, listen, I'm going to call you back next week. I'm going to call you on Tuesday at eight. I'm committed to calling you. It's bullshit. I, I'm already making an agreement with myself not to do it or to bail on it or to maybe delay or hesitate. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and so anyway, yeah, it's funny. We used to always accuse, I, 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 so I still believe and he's passed away, but I still believe that there is potentially some connection there because Lucas is from here. It's, it's entirely possible that there was some connection between George Lucas and this guy. Unless if, what, if, I, unless like this guy, he gave the uh, advice to, uh, another guy that George Lucas met and they were trying to like write the story together. Yeah, that's and, fair. That's yeah, fair. Like, it's just, they, uh, it's possible they were one at least one or two handshakes away. Could be, could be, could be. But it's it's a nice, as as I always like to say, you know, when something will happen and, and it's not quite right, I'm always I'm always big on well in the movie version. You know, you're going to hit that game winning shot. You know what I mean? The movie version, you do this. In the movie version, they definitely know each other. In reality, who knows? I got it, Mark. You're like. <laughs> you're a real intelligent guy and like, you're real, like you're really like, I haven't met too many men, uh, you know, uh, of your age group that actually have such a vibrant, passionate love of life and energy about them too. Like you got so much charisma, dude. You really do. You and you and, you and Leander with the age, you know, I'm just teasing you. I, I got to own my age, but I just don't, I'm trying actually on this film. There was a kid, Ronnie, he's 19 years old. He was volunteering on daily city. And he comes up to me and he, at the end, his big eyes. He goes, seriously, can I just ask you one question? I go, what? He goes, how old are you? <laughs> so I told him and he goes, how can you act this way at your age? And I said, oh, it's really simple. I said, you start acting immature at your age and you just don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. Right? No, I mean. Yeah, I go, yes. you can't start at my age. You can't start being, you know, ask my wife. You can't start being an immature pain in the ass at my age. You got to keep doing it. And then when yeah. I'm really old, people will think it's quaint when I'm like, and I'm trying to reach out and I'm grabbing oh, girls the wrong way. I'm just old. You know what I mean? Ah, look at that. He's so cute. He's so old. Right. So, well, it reminds me of Burgess Meredith and grumpy old men. <laughs> exactly. S the same exact guy. Slipping in and then to the right. Honestly, I will say that is one reason I do like making these, these films, the student films, the energy is just so good. I do find that a lot of people that are more my actual age group are just so goddamn, they're just boring. They're just, they're not trying to do something different and shake it up. And that is what I learned from Susselman. This dude, this shrink I'm talking about, he would read in between, like I'd come in and he had five minutes between each patient. He'd be reading a book. I'm like, what are you doing? You're 90. What? What do you have left to read? And he's like, there's so many things I need to read. I'm like, what do you do? Just be old. Just sit there. He's like, no, I got to read a page here. He just, he was sharp as a tack because he kept, he kept the, the engine running the whole time. It's like Tyrion Lannister, you know, he always reading, building his mind. Right. Uh, yeah. So kept anyway. him young, kept him going where the mind goes, you go. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I mean, you know, well, let's, let's, we need to get on goddamn Yellowstone together. Facts, yo, petition. Uh, anybody out there like I would uh, love to God, I would love life? to be in a fight scene with what's his name, Kevin Costner. Wouldn't that be the greatest thing? I get to punch fake punch Kevin Costner or real punch. I him. want to punch his son Jamie for Kevin Costner oh, God, or, or hold character or so hold, much. Hold Jamie's head while Kevin beats the Jamie shit out. Is so annoying. He's a fantastic actor. Like I but oh my god, he's doing character. such a good job. But the, the character, nah, I don't. Uh, I got no empathy for this kid. I, I know. I love his wife though. She's so bad. I love that character too because she's such a wild card and she's kind of slutty and smart and just does whatever she wants. She's very, there's not a lot of women characters like that. I mean, there's yeah, more and more now. That he had a key, uh, the kid with or the new one that just showed up in five. Oh, you know, I haven't seen five yet. I know I got to watch it. Oh yeah. No, I know who you're talking about. His wife. Uh, very cute. And uh, the, no, I mean, the one, the, the, the daughter, the, you know, the main daughter, the daughter of Kevin Costner in it. Oh, her? Yeah, oh, her. yeah. 
I'm, I'm I, that I know. Yeah. I'm just trying to remember why she got blown up and kind of wish it was Jamie. That was, well, in she the room got now. blown up because remember they were like going to kill all of them. And she was one of the blown up people. Yeah. And it's just like, where the fuck's the FBI? How come that we're not really like taking this <laughs> yeah, seriously? Like, I love that too. It's like, we're just handling it on our own. You know what it's I mean? Like, like it was just a gas leak. No, a bomb went off. Like we had like, you, like this is post nine 11 America that we're I living. Know. Now. Like, I know that's so funny how they do these things. Like I love cop shows too. We're like, they're going to go after like, you know, a paramilitary group and it's just the two stars. I would have liked it better if they had the U S marshals kind of have a side right. story coming in and just sort of like, uh, got in some information for you. There's a whole subplot going well, there. Well, you, I mean, like your thing today about the, the fire, like, right? I mean, there was probably a, like 20 fire trucks there, right? And if that had been a similar police action, you know, you don't go break up a pill, you know, you and I, hey, let's go grab your, grab your gun and a rifle. And you, there's no time to call anyone. Like if you were, if you were going after some big group like that, there'd be 500 cops showing up. You know what I mean? Like, like to your point, like there's that, even though it's the middle of Montana, there would be the U.S., there would be the National Guard showing up if bl- bombs were blowing up in the middle of a city and they were killing people on their ranches. It was a terrorist attack, unless it literally it's just like it was just it was just it was just Wednesday in June. Like, I, so I think it showed a lot about the culture where it's just like, yeah, dynamite mining, things like this happen all the time. Everybody's got a gun. We're not going to panic. There it's was a just going to be four guys on horses going after them. Yeah, it's like they they put more attention in uh, national security towards the fucking wolves than a bomb going off in downtown. Yeah, wherever. <laughs> I love well, the show. I mean, it's, it's like, hard to have a modern day Wild West show and actually have reality, right? I mean, that that shows strains all credibility. You know what I mean? We had U.S. marshals in westerns many times. Like, yes. you know, that's they, what I mean. They do exist. They do exist. Kevin Costner played a U.S. marshal. Uh, marshal. He was once Wyatt Earp. He did. He did. So, all right, uh, season six, you got, you got, you're going to have to raise the stakes a little bit, you know, right. the closest right. thing to raising the stakes was bringing the president to the reservation yes. and they shot the fucking dogs. What a bunch of assholes. <laughs> all right. Now you got it. You got me back into watching it now. Cause I was like, uh, I've kind of had enough of Kevin being them trying to make us feel like he somehow is being per- persecuted and has it worse than native Americans. I'm like, how, how does he get away with saying that in his, in his, in his TV show? I don't know, but it was really 1883 and 1923 spinoff series that got me really into Yellowstone because I heard good things. Are those but good? I have not seen either of those. Are those good? 1923 was phenomenal. I loved it. I really did. I thought the story was definitely there. Uh, definitely worth the free trials. And uh, 1883, I watched that first. And uh, I just didn't know how to understand it the first time I watched it because I didn't see a single thing about Yellowstone. But oh. when I... And now I tied it all together and I rewatched it and I'm like, that is awesome. Like I loved it in the beginning, but it was just, uh, it was just a totally different experience. I got to check those. Those would be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they're on, I know 1883 was on Netflix, but yeah, no, I saw them. We, we definitely had them on list watch. So we'll definitely do that. Yeah. If you're, if you don't got anything going on, you got time to binge and you know, uh, you got a bottle of whiskey, go, go for it. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. Good weekend plan. It's Friday uh, Eve, so let's go. You're you're gonna love it. No, it's a very I, I recommend them. They're great shows, and the acting is there. It's it's awesome. very it's very. Well, so we're good. gonna go out. We're gonna do a little western. We're gonna practice our cutting and moving, and 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 maybe we'll do some little self tapes and send them to the producers of Yellowstone. Like you're missing out. We got we got original we got original. We do like a father son thing. We come riding into town, and like we're the. Maybe we're related to them somehow and they were the black sheep. They didn't want to, you know, we're going to come in and claim our thing or some sort of crap like that. I'm a hundred percent down. Of course. I'm a, of course I'm a hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent down. <laughs> Let's do it. I, I look like an ox, but I'm definitely down. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. You can fight him. It's perfect. I fight Kevin. Good. You fight this, this son-in-law. We're, we're good to go. That would be kind of cool. The one person I, uh, the one person I wouldn't mess with is the rainwater family. Those guys, those guys are lethal and awesome. No, it's true. That's true. They are. I'm just waiting them to come in and just start really showing like who they truly are. Cause I don't know. I'm not sure where season six is going to go. It's just like, we got problems where the state's going to get bankrupt. Oh, the terrorist thing still doesn't bother you. <laughs> <laughs> they just blow up stuff randomly. That's so funny. It must be more common than, you know, tourism. Yeah, it's ca- yeah. You hear about that coming from Montana all the time, right? Or yeah, Wyoming they, or wherever they are. They do. And it's just yeah, like they, yeah. they do. And it's all hidden. 
that's why we have ranches with no, you know, with no fences. <laughs> exactly. Well, Mark, anytime I'd love to hear your podcast, please send me a link sometime. I will. You should check it out. Definitely. I will. And you enjoy the rest of your evening and I guess I'll catch you later. All right. Thank you, sir. It's been fun. And just uh, take this with you wherever you go to always remember to never forget community, creativity, and joy. Oh, I love that. I saw you wrote that. That's awesome. Community, creativity, yeah. and joy. That's it. That's it, man. That's, how, that's, that's the way remember it is. Remember to never forget. That's the important part. I incorporated a little New York uh, twist in there. I love it. That's awesome. Ciao for now, buddy. All right, bro. Take care.